Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as clear a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, right? 50-50 ball, I got to come down with You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. So Nick yelled at me. I think you heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know we're on, Nick. I don't know if you know this, but I I, I see the monitor there. Aggie baseball, officially number one. This is how we're going to start off Tex Ags Radio. Welcome into Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, the Go Hour, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. The Sweep. The Sweep sweep. heard around the world, Olin Buchanan. Good morning, buddy, with your awesome hair and your awesome shirt, guns popping, John Travolta, Button to midway. You're looking good this morning. Well, thanks, I guess. You're looking good, bro. Well, it was time to get the old uh, summer cut, right? So, Well, how about that uh, almost summer beatdown this that weekend? That was awesome. So 36 runs over the weekend. Yeah. 36 to 6. The Aggies now have won seven out of their last nine series. And the 36 runs on the weekend against Vanderbilt, the highest all time in an SEC series. What say you, Olin Buchanan? Um, uh Gosh, they're just, uh, it's, it's amazing uh, because, but, but here's what I want to focus on. I okay. want to focus on how well they pitched for the most part this weekend. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Olin. Because I knew they could hit, right? We knew coming into the season this team would hit. I remember being at Broniger's wedding and talking to a couple of the coaches. Yep. And they were saying, hey, I asked one of them, I said, uh, how would you think the power of this team is going to compare to that team that went to the College World Series? He said, oh, we got so much more power. I said really? I said, oh yeah, without a doubt. Well, you know, they're they're proving it to be true. Sure. But if there's ever a, a question, it was. <clears throat> but how's the pitching going to be? And yeah, you know, I know Vanderbilt scored some runs yesterday, but to have back to back shutouts, back to back shutouts, back to back beatdowns. <clears throat> I mean, you outscore them twenty-four to zero well, to start the series. It's really back to back to back beatdowns, but you yeah. had to you had to work a little bit. You had to work uh, a little bit. You were down. You know, yeah, you yeah. had a nice fifth inning to, to, came, to what, make six it great. Runs in yeah. the fifth inning. Uh, but Ryan Prager started it off, and so not only did I text you and Nick this weekend just mm-hmm. to remind yes. you guys of Nostra Nuno or what, uh, what did you call me? Nuno Stradamus. Nu- okay. So what was it? Bank on it? Is that what we did? Yeah, bank on it. Okay, bank on it. I said, I want Ryan Prager to have uh, an appearance where he sets the tone. And I think I said where we don't No, You You said said, you wanted Ashton back. I said, I don't want to see Ashton back. You were the one who said no Ashton. So you get uh, credit for that. And I said, multi-homer games by Jace and Braden. And you got that too. I did. God, buddy. What are the lottery numbers this week? 13. Is there a lottery this week? There's lottery every week. Okay, Twice. Sorry. Yeah. I don't I don't play the lottery. Does that surprise you? No. <laughs> Bottom line I do. Does that surprise you? No, not at all. <laughs> no, <really? laughs> Bottom line is that uh this team is doing a little bit of everything. If there was a question, it was pitching. If there was a question when the season was going on, bullpen beyond Evan Oshenbeck, right? Yeah. And Chris Cortez yesterday. Cortez. Yeah. His last two start. I mean his last two appearances. Eight point one innings. I looked this up today. 8.1 innings, I think it's two hits. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, two hits, two walks, one hit by pitch, 15 strikeouts, no runs. I think that's excellent, Obi. I think yeah, that that's yeah. the word to use for it. And here's it. a guy that, you know, you always worried about. You know, you thought, had a lot of ability, but is he going to get on this? Uh-huh. Like, he's like this this fucking bronc that they finally tamed. Pardon? A fucking bronc. Okay, make sure I heard you correctly. That they finally tamed. Yeah. Tame that Bronx. Tame that. Ride him. You are in a good mood. Ride him, Cowboy. Tell me more. Tell me more. Ride him, Cortez. (laughs) Okay, maybe not that. (laughs) Anyway, 
Uh, if there was a question, it was pitching. If there was a follow-up question, it was the bullpen. And who do we credit for all this? I'm going to credit several people. Okay. You got your skipper. You got Jim Schlossnagel. <laughs> Absolutely. The real deal. The real deal. I'm going to credit Max Wiener. Of course, Max Wiener. I mean, not only just superb dude, the job he has done. Look around the conference. You know, what he's been able to do with pretty much – New, some of the same guys, some new guys, and just redevelop them, re got them re, refocused. Yeah, you know what? His, um, his profile uh, was already really high. Yep. It's going to be even – every – I think every program in the country might be trying to hire him in the offseason. Maybe even as the head coach, say, hey, look, we saw what you did at A&M. Uh, do it for us. And, you had a question on the thread. I wonder how this team's offense would uh, compare to the Tennessee from, offense. From, from was it two years 2022. ago? 2022. When they they yep. were just, I think, if my memory serves. So I'm gonna I'm gonna allow our engineer um, Matthew Dawson to do some some math, right? But A and M's offense versus 2022 Tennessee. The Vols hit that year. A lot I mean, that, they were really good. 158 home runs. 158. Wow. The Ags have 73 on the year. 32 games for A&M. The Vols that year played in 66 games. Okay. And they have the Aggies have 19 games left before the SEC tournament. Okay. So, Dawson, if you but, want to be on pace, guy. Put in those 66 games for Tennessee would have included everything. everything. That, that's the, everything that they did. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And A&M has played in 32 games. I'm not saying that they're going to have as many, the power numbers are going to be equal to Tennessee, but I was thinking, gosh, I remember how everybody nationally was just raving about that Tennessee offense. And I don't know the numbers, but I do remember they're putting up huge numbers. And well, here's AM putting up huge numbers. I just wonder how it compared. Yeah. No, I don't know if you're going to reach those level of, of homers, but it doesn't matter. You're reaching, I think Bronny was. The first one to call, I th- he thought they were going to break the season record, which is 120, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think they're going to reach it. Yeah, I think so. You know what, though? I don't care if they reach Tennessee's homers. I just hope they do what Tennessee didn't do. Get to the College World Get Series. Get to the College World Series. So the A&M, <clears throat> Texas A&M Aggies are about on pace for 116 home runs. If you're just including those 19 games that are left, you're hitting 2.28 home runs a game, which is pretty nuts. A Tennessee team, though, they had 2.4 per game. Okay. So we're, we're not point, on that pace. We're point two behind Tennessee. Point two behind Tennessee, which in a magnitude, right, when you have like 67 but games, that, that is a big difference. That A&M has that. Uh, they haven't played LSU yet. And with the way their pitching is oh. going, <laughs> you, you, might, you might catch up to Tennessee. And part of the reason A&M is number one, it could have been back-to-back sweeps, let's be honest, right? It could have been. Yeah. But Arkansas lost a series to Alabama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're they only have three SEC losses on the year, and you know what? I I brought this up three last week, and I, and it, and and I could be dead wrong on this because I don't watch it as close as the guys covering it for obvious reasons. I'm not covering it, but I think if you look at the teams that Arkansas's played, the more challenging teams remain on their schedule. As if you look at A and M schedule. They played most, with the exception of Arkansas, maybe Alabama. Even though Alabama six and nine in conference play, uh, I think A and M. Look, they still have Alabama six and nine in conference. Ole Miss five and ten. LSU three and twelve. Georgia's fading seven and eight, and then Arkansas, right? So all I'm saying is Arkansas may be A and M still has to continue to play well and take care of their business and all those things. But if you just look at the caliber of yep. opponents left, um. A&M has a great opportunity here. Let me tell you what Arkansas has left on their year, if you don't mind. I would like to know that. A uh, interesting two-game series with Texas Tech in the middle of this week. Oh, okay. All right, Texas Tech on the 16th and the 17th. Then they're at South Carolina, South Cacalac. Right? On, on the road. Yep. Yeah. I'm just going to give you the rest of the SEC Tough series. Spot. They host Florida. Okay. They are at Kentucky. Uh, the uh, team that's 13-1 or 14-1, yeah. I think. Mississippi State. They host pretty them. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, this team that they're, they're going to play after that is pretty good, too. I yeah, think they're in the top. One. Yeah. Oh, yeah, number one. Texas A&M. Yeah. All, so, see, the point I'm making is that while, yes, A&M absolutely can't overlook anybody and they have to continue to play well, but if you just go by the conference records of the teams you face, 
Arkansas appears to have a more challenging road in front of them than Texas A&M does. Yep. Now, but, I know Jim Sloss ain't going to say, dude, every game, this is the SEC. I don't care what the record is. It's a challenge. I get that. All right? But you're just saying as of today, if you were to look at what's left on the schedule, A&M has taken on a lot of their – they still have – Couple of very hard series, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, every series. I mean, Alabama is hard. just won a series over uh, over Arkansas. then number one Arkansas, or right. were they were number two at the time? Dawson, were they one or two? They were I one, right? They were number one. Yeah. So and it so was Alabama's at home. Alabama's going to be facing the number one team back to back back to back weekends. Hmm. Look at that. So, props to the Aggies. Look, bottom line is when you hit the way they do, when you pitch the way they do, when you feel the way they do. You have a chance in every series, not only to win every series, you have a chance. This is a couple series in a row. Like, they were so close to sweeping last week, right? And that's yeah. why the, the pedigree of a championship team, we said it last week, that they could have easily, you know, said, all right, whatever, we, we're going to lose the, the last game because they fell behind. And they just kept on fighting back, fighting back. The blood in the water that this team sees in series is to me like, they're relentless. 9-0? Nope. 15-0? Nope. Let's keep going. And what strikes me, and I don't know if, if this is statistically accurate, but it just strikes me as somebody who's watching from the outside, not covering them on a daily basis. But early in the year, they were really dependent on the top of the order for offensive production. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying nobody didn't hit up and down the order, but highly dependent. Now, they're hitting up and down the lineup. Mm-hmm. I mean uh, – and uh, that just makes them even more dangerous, obviously. One thing I really love, by the way, I, because as a talk show host and, and OB for you to write columns, sometimes it's we want to be able to talk about everything, mm-hmm. but th- this community is so thirsty for football that it, it fills up the tank easily, right? Like we can do three hours of football every day, right? But people are clamoring for more baseball. Yeah. They want more baseball. And, they, and, they, and they're going to get it. Yeah. I might even need to get out there and draw it. Write a baseball column. I think you will. I might have to I think do that. we just assigned it right now on the I show. I have to do that. Chief executive here, David Nuno, assigning that story to Olin Buchanan. Huh. 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 By the way, do you know, I bet you know this, who's going to be on the show today? Ryan Broniger. Yeah, he's going to be on too. Billy Lucci. Yeah, he's on the show, yeah. Jim Schlossnagel. Yes, that's uh, the one that's I was the getting one. at. I saved the best for last. You did save the best for I, last. Know, I had the guy in the number three position, you know, the heavy hitter to drive in some runs. And you're Braden Montgomery, per think, se. Thinking the way I do, I mean, the what we know about Schloss, I'm sure he's elated. But he is focused on the next one. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. it's like, that's great. We did it. Now what's next? Yeah, coaches never seem to enjoy the wins as much as everybody else. But Because they're – until the last one. Sure. Because they're so focused on ma- making sure that my guys aren't celebrating prematurely. Yeah. And then uh, just focus on what's it going to take to win the next one. I forget. Maybe it was Belichick. One championship-level coach who's won multiple ones said the pressure started the day after a championship. Like, they, they couldn't really enjoy it because now how do I do it again? And now how do I do it again? So let's just get it the yeah. first time. Yeah, you, you, it's okay to give yourself a few weeks or a month or whatever to enjoy it if you win a championship. But So I think everybody, rightly so, is going to enjoy the fact that A&M is ranked number one. Maybe yep. – is this like the first time since 99? I don't know. No, no, no. They no, were number, been number one before? Okay. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think in 2016, does that sound right, Dawson? Do a little research yeah, on that. Yeah, that's right, with the Boomer White team and everything. Yeah, yeah I should know that because uh, I'm sure Gabe talked about it. Um, but it doesn't come around that often that you're number one. So, yeah, yeah. enjoy it, celebrate it, but I guarantee you uh, – Schloss Eagles telling those guys, hey, you, you know what? It's it doesn't matter. Number. Like, well, you want to be number one at the end. At the end. You want to be number one in, uh, in Omaha doing a dog pile. Was it two years ago that Ole Miss was, wasn't even going to make right. the tournament? And then they end up winning the so, national Some say they were the last team in. The last team in, yeah. So, good stuff. We want to hear from you guys. You can call in. You, you know who talk. was number one that year? Who was number one? Was, Most of that year? Uh, Tennessee. Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee. Tennessee. Yeah. You don't know that song. Yeah. No. I want to hear from you. How are you feeling about this baseball team? What did you like about this weekend? By the way, props to Aggie fans everywhere. Second largest home attendance for but, but, a baseball but, series. But, but beyond AM baseball, what a weekend. Women's tennis. Softball. Softball. They're Football still going. recruiting. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. We got a lot to talk about. Yeah. Great weekend. Tomorrow, I think in the nine o'clock hour, the Dreamweaver. The Dreamweaver. 
He's living that dream. Three straight conference championships. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw it. I'm sure uh, Dawson will get into it. The uh, Aggie women's tennis team picked up another player that used to play their back. Oh. Back. Big name. Big, oh. big name. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, if you want to be a part of it, 979-693-1150. 979-693-1150. This is talk, uh, Coffee Talk presented by Texax Coffee. Beat the hell out of mornings by going to texags.com slash coffee. Let's go behind the glass and say hi to Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy, good morning, y'all. You got the uniform, uh, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I know. I got the memo. But yeah, I mean, busy weekend, busy morning for me. You know it's a good show or is a good weekend when I'm making graphics up until the very start of the show. Uh, and I actually stole this little note from uh, the, the SEC Network broadcast. They put it up on, on uh, ye- during yesterday's game. So the numbers weren't completely updated, but how about the Aggies in SEC play at Bluebell Park? They're eight and one. They've scored eight point eight runs per game, or they're averaging that. They've hit twenty five home runs. They have thirty seven extra base hits, and they're holding their opponents to four point three runs per game. So that's just absolute dominance at Bluebell Park. And we talk about that a lot in football, right? Is win your home games. Well, you know, Aggie baseball doing it protecting Bluebell Park and, uh, you know, a record crowd, like you said, OB, and giving them a lot to cheer about this weekend. I don't even think we've brought up the name Gavin Grahovic in the first 16 minutes of this show. That's a a disgrace by the two hosts. There's just so many good players there. Yeah, yeah. But he had a phenomenal weekend. I mean, you you could bring up Travis Chestnut, too, who I covered. I covered him before he came to the, the Aggies when he played a summer for the Bombers. I was like, my goodness, this kid... Is so fast. I just thought he was going to be a, a great, you know, base running asset for the Aggies, but he, he can went, swing the stick he went too. Went yard, yeah. I just like saying went yard. He did. He did go yard. Now look, there's so many. I could bring up Jason Lavalette. Lavalette. Brady Montgomery. We, we mentioned him at the top of the show, but like they all did. Ali Camarillo. Hello. Yesterday. Ali Camarillo. Ali Camarillo. Yeah. Say it. Say it. Ali Camarillo. Now slow it down when you say it. Ali Camarillo. I like that one. That was good. <laughs> good stuff, Nick. Thank you very much. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. We've already heard from him. Matthew Dawson still with us. Matthew, good morning. Good morning. I wanted to talk about the attendance a little bit for a second. Before this weekend, a was averaging about 5,800 uh, attendance per game, which is about 94.8% capacity. After this weekend, they're averaging 5,946 with a 97.5% capacity average for the I entire I was going to go Saturday uh, to, uh, but buy a ticket, right? Because Irma wanted to come. Yep. And uh, the only, you know, I went online, the only tickets that were available were on the, the lawn. And I said, well, I'm not, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to find a seat. So we'll just watch it on TV. Uh, but th- to the point of what he's saying is, you know, it's it's a hot ticket. It's a difficult ticket to get now. Yeah. So our, uh, our former host, Gabe Bach, he had an event yesterday um, for his company, uh, Bach Realty, he and Megan's. And I went for a little bit. One TV, the Masters. The other TV, Aggie Baseball. It was, it was, again, great weekend. Yeah, Matthew? So let's get into the women's tennis that you were talking about just a little bit there. 4-0, they swept Alabama. They were ranked number 29th in the, S, or in the country, and that marks the first three-peats from an SEC team since Texas A&M joined the SEC in 2012. So regular season champions, three years in a row. That's a pretty good program. If you ask me, that I'm is, asking you. Is it a good program? It's a good program, okay. David. Just it's a good program. Make sure we got the question then. Also wanted to bring up uh, women's golf earns the three seed in the SEC championships. Zoe Slaughter actually is already teed off. She teed off at 7:50 this morning, and they will be playing against Arkansas. Um, good luck to the Aggie ladies. Ooh. Track and field also had their meet this weekend. Ahmad Robinson dropped his first outdoor sub 45 of the season or of his entire career. Ran the uh, 444 nine eight which is really good. Number 11th all-time for Texas A&M. It was second at the meet. Uh, very impressive performance. Kamar Farquharson claimed the men's 800 title on the final day of the meet on the Tom Jones Memorial. And also, if you check tomorrow's rankings, we'll see where A&M ranks then. But as of this morning and as of last week, the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Association, sorry, a lot of words right there, they ranked number one last week and the week before that. And the week before that, so we'll see where they end up this week. Yeah, there's multiple programs with a one in front of their name. That's that's a good thing. It's that's, a good thing. That's wonderful. That's the way it should be here. Hey, I, you know I like to compete, right? Yeah, I'm a yeah. competitor. Yeah. Right now, YouTube's kicking everybody's butt. 
All right. YouTube is all in on baseball. Textags.com, three people talking. All right. On the, on the chat, I should say. The text line, only a couple of text messages. Are you guys just listening? I want to hear from you. YouTube is winning the game. I'm trying to get people to represent. YouTube today you. is more like Aggie baseball. Talk to me. Right now, the text line, more like Vanderbilt. I'm just telling the truth. Is that rude? Come, no, no. All right. The truth, the not, truth hurts sometimes. Sometimes it hurts. YouTube, Come on. way to represent. Talk Come to on, me. chat. Aggie, angry El, Ella, not Angry Elephant. Sure. Aggie Engineering 12. We love uh, the Angry Elephant. He's texting. But where's everybody else? I want to hear from the people because this is a, this is exactly what we envisioned when they hired Schloss. Yes. Right? We, yes. And he's doing it. He's doing it. And they're number one in the do freaking it, country. It. And the number one in the nation. I don't know what this accent nation. Was. Was that a New York accent? What was no, that? No, I was like, didn't you ever see that Starskin Hutch movie where he goes, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> yeah, you were right. 2016 was the last time Texas A&M baseball was ranked number one. March 26th, to be exact. I am not a historian, but I remember that for some reason. It stuck, uh, stuck with me. All right, we'll hit a break. When we come back on Texas Radio, yeah, we'll get to your text messages. Yeah, we'll get to your phone calls. And yeah, we're going to talk a little football stuff because there was some recruiting to, to talk about. Right now, career opportunities for the association of former students. They're going to be in studio again today. Looking forward to talking to Scott. But looking for a reason to come back to Aggieland and live here so you can go watch that number one baseball team anytime you want to go see what you need to do. Do it. You need to go to uh, the Association of Former Students website at tx.ag slash association jobs to see what kind of jobs they have because they got a bunch of jobs out there. They want to hire professionals to join their team. A couple of areas you can look. Fundraising, former student programs, and much, much more, including the marketing team. They are the premier alumni association and the oldest organization serving A&M in support of that Aggie network, and they play a part in each and every Aggie story from Howdy to hear. Don't miss the opportunity to miss out the association during their socials, Aggie Ring Day, class reunions, Aggie Muster, and everything in between. Join a team that exemplifies those Aggie core values, integrity, excellence, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service, all in support of that worldwide Aggie network. Again, visit tx.ag slash association jobs. Do it. Do it. Do it.
Do you know this one? Yeah, I've heard it before, but if I could choose to die, it would be in your arms. Huh. Huh. I wonder how the other person would feel about that. That would be a lot of guilt. <laughs> <laughs> no! I don't want to It's like uh, the old Rodney Dangerfield line says, um, when my father died, he wanted me in his lap. He was in the electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> Texax Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour presented by the Warehouse of CC Creations. Uh, who's the number one team in the country? The Texas A&M Aggies. Woo! The baseball team? Yeah. Yeah, okay, making sure. And, I and, mean, we got so many good programs, and, and, I'm just and, making and sure. And the track and field. Yeah. Hello? Hey, maybe... Maybe the women's tennis. Who knows? The Dream Weavers. Going. Let's but go. We we'll get them on. Tomorrow. You know, you need somebody that can, uh, a coach that can weave together all this talent and make it a championship caliber team. And they have a weaver. Hey, I, I want to bring something up. I, I understand that certain words I apparently say interestingly. You know, I don't say it. Some so somebody brought to my attention that I I said I say eggy instead of Aggie. I feel like I say huh. Aggie normal, but. Huh. I've never noticed that. Um, the shoe fly says, uh, as David Nuno says, he's an eggy. Do I say eggy? I've never. N- I've never noticed, noticed that. Never once heard you say that, David. Shoe fly, you suck. I'm kidding. No, You're probably no, great. You're no, probably fine. No, he's listening. Thank you. No, of course I'm just playing. Come on, you know how I respond. Of course I do. Do I, I might say it like that? I don't know. I I know you, there's certain words I say that are like Billy will bring. Like mm, I don't know about that. Maybe one. you said it one time in a rush, or it sounded like mm. that. But I, I've never. It's, He's an eggy. He's an eggy. No, I don't think I say it like that. Huh. I'm, I'm going to start saying it, though. It's going to become no. word. Hey, can I take a moment to thank a good friend? Absolutely. So I have a very good friend named Philip, all right? Okay. I don't agree with all his baseball ideas. In fact, the most recent one I think is ridiculous. That being said, um, I'm trying to build a shed in the backyard. Not like out of wood, because, you know, I can't do that. I bought one at Costco, right, to build okay. Okay. And the video, 26 minutes to put together, eight hours later, right, it's not right, built yet. Yeah. But I called him for, you know, just I thought a little bit of help. He came over and was there for like six hours. So thank you to Philip oh. for good friends. I, it's hard for me to ask for help. Right. And I think it's even harder for people to give the, you know, unconditional help. He came over and he was there until like 8.30 last night. Um, so props to, to Philip. It's good to have friends that you can call. Oh, and ask. yeah. Because yeah. if I called you, you'd come. I would come. I, you probably wouldn't be able to fix that. Well, thing. that's why I didn't call but you. But I'd have brought my friend Doug Beck with me who can fix anything. Well, we might need Doug because <laughs> Philip is a civil engineer, and we still can't figure it out. We can't get the roof to fit correctly, huh. you know. So, but thank you to, to him. Also, uh, props to this gentleman right here. His name is Matthew Dawson. Matthew Dawson. I, I think you're aware. He was the MC yesterday at the Warrior Dash. Oh, okay. Warrior Dash? Gladiator Dash. Sorry. Gladiator Dash. You got it. Gladiator Dash. Yeah. There you go. Uh, he did a phenomenal job. He gave props to Tex Ags. I heard that in the middle of the course. I think Irma did it too, is right? Right? Did she do it recently or no? No. Oh, I thought she post- posted that she's done it recently or something. Oh, maybe she had, I don't know. She oh. don't. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. regardless. Yeah. Shout out to Renee, our guy, our t- sound tech. People were telling me that they could hear. Like, I mean, it was a it was a pretty long course. It was, it was a 5K. We're close to it, uh, but people could hear. You know, the PA system from all the way on the course. So that was a really good shot. And actually, we got the final total. It's about estimated that from the race, uh, we made about one hundred forty nine thousand dollars from it, and then about one hundred to cover for the cost for the race. About one hundred fifteen thousand of it will be donated to the Still Creek Ranch, which is the beneficiary. So that was really cool. And the, the before we started the race, the gentleman who gave us the pep talk. Um, yeah, I think you should kind of give you. I don't know if you heard this, Matthew, but he was like, "Hey, when you're doing these obstacles, it's nothing like the the obstacles these kids are going through." And it was kind of like very motivating. But uh, props to Tyler and Miranda Powers who dominated the course. They 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 slayed it. They were that, fantastic. That doesn't surprise me. Either. No, I did okay. You see all those videos of Miranda all pregnant and working out hard, yeah, lifting weights, doing backflips. I don't think that's yeah. recommended. You shouldn't do backflips when you're. But she did it. Uh, she was awesome. I felt like Mark uh, Phelps on, on the swim portion. There was a very short swim, and like, shoo, I felt great. My running wasn't up to par. There's no doubt about that. But it was it was a great, great course and uh, awesome experience. You out said there. you strained your hamstring, though. I, I don't. I, I'm, I strained it. I didn't hurt it. There was a part where you go downhill. You know, old guys, when we go downhill quickly, you can kind of. I it was fine. It didn't cause any issues. I just I just slowed down a little bit. Anyway, baseball team more more well. More baseball. Going on the road to take on an Alabama team who just beat the number one team on, in, the, in the country. Does this baseball team remind you at all? I'm starting at the, the, the lineup, right, the, the hitting. Uh, remind you at all of your, of your beloved Oakland A's, that Bash Brothers year? 
Well, definitely not the steroids. Um, <laughs> definitely not blowing the World Series to the Los Angeles Dodgers. There's no Cubans. There's no Cubans on this team, but, but there is got, Ali Camarillo. Ali Camarillo. Say it slow again. Ali Camarillo. There's your R&B voice. I, I'm trying to figure out who they remind. You know what they're? They're just they're made in the image of Schloss. They play the way that he wants them to play ball. Okay, I'm sorry I, I interrupted your thought. No, no, no. That's, that, this is where we're going. No, but they, I see what you're saying. Like, they just got to get it done, and they're getting it done each week. Now they got another test with Alabama, a team that's already proven they can beat the number one team in the country. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we know how hard it is to win on the road in the SEC. I wonder, because, I, again, I, I'm just looking at scores. I wonder, everybody knows about Arkansas's pitching is, is really good. I wonder yeah. what, their, what their hitting is like. I wonder if they're a team that, do they typically win games like four to three or five to four? That, that, or, or, you know, do they typically score five runs, four runs, and, and yet just hold a team – to uh, two, you know, one, two, or three runs. I can tell you that they're first in the SEC in batting average, oh. second in OBP, first in slugging percentage, first in OPS, first in runs, first Sounds in doubles. Good. That's pretty good. It's a pretty good ball club. <laughs> they're a really good team. Mm-hmm. Really, really good. Yeah. I'm, you know who else is good? Our team. Our team. Our team battle tested Aggies. Eggies. The Eggies. The Eggies. See you in. Uh, see you in May, Hogs. Winderong on the uh, tech, text Axe chat. Nunya, I hear you talking crap about the listeners. Sorry, we can't be number one like the baseball team. Not really talking. I, I, I'm just expecting more of the participation, right? Like, let, let, let's let this us. baseball team feel the love on the show. Feel it. Feel the love. Talk to us. Call us. You got good sleep last night, didn't you? I actually did. I can tell. And I got up early and got my two mile run in. So I'm feeling good. Because you know what I did? I. Uh, and nobody cares about this, so I'll do it real fast. Uh, booked a vacation yesterday. Got three months to get in reasonably decent shape. So woke up ready to go. Diet. Diet. All right. I got your back. If you need anything, you know that. All right, we're headed to break. We'll do more baseball. We'll do some football when we come back. Let's talk Heritage Films. Do That's, it. Do it. That's Chance McLean's company. <laughs> I, mine is more like a John Granado. I don't know if you John John Granado do it. Yours He's is more Houston than, sports guy. Right? Yeah, yeah. He do it. He, he talks like that. All right. Anyway, documentary. Oh, and John Granado worked with Chance McClain. See the segue right ah, there. There you go. They worked together. They were partners there at, at uh, fifteen sixty. The game back in the day. Heritage Films is a company that makes documentary films about families, about people, about family businesses, family ranches. They're so, so good. They are fantastic about telling people stories. And they've been doing it for a few years now. And they tell a lot of Aggie stories in these two-hour documentaries. Aggies care about their story, right? Well, how about a documentary on this baseball team? How about a documentary on your grandfather? How about a documentary on your mother, your father, whoever it may be, right? They do it, and they do it at the highest level. They do these two-hour documentaries. Chance is a down-to-earth guy, but he's been all over the world doing these stories, right? He's done red carpet shows. He's done documentaries. He's done... Uh, Broadway musicals, and he's obviously started uh, this awesome company, Heritage Films. A side thing that they do is called the Year Flicks, a 20-minute video Q&A, more for the younger kids, benchmark videos that tell the story in about 20 minutes. But then you follow it up in a couple years and find out where your kid's grown even more, from freshman year of college to sophomore to when they get their Aggie ring to when they graduate, meet their loved one. It is an amazing thing that Chance does. The website, yourheritagefilm.com, yourheritagefilm.com, 713-893-8341. 
Welcome back into the program, Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour, presented by? Uh, CC Creations. Yeah, the warehouse there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good place. So Nick Savage brings to my attention, YouTube is popping right now, all right? They're, they're winning the day. They're, they're slaying. Uh, we have football level numbers on the YouTube page, which is good. The, this baseball team deserves that. So those of you who are new or don't come often, uh, like, comment, subscribe. Please help us out out there. Texags.com is starting to, to play the catch up. And the uh, the text line really participating on there. And again, this is all for the uh, the baseball team love right here. Brandon says, listening at work, you guys make my Monday tolerable. At the game on Saturday night, great energy. Excited to see how far they go. Brandon, class of 96. So... There's no reason to believe this team will not go far. You cannot take it for granted, as we all know, but their pitching's good, their hitting's excellent. The it seems like that the defense is good. Matthew and I were talking about Camarillo's a, got a good glove at shortstop. A kid in left field's doing amazing things for left fielder. You know, a lot of speed in the outfield. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, what was it? It was uh, Broninger, right? Last week, because we four said, "Hey, go ahead and enjoy ex- it. Enjoy the fact that this yep. is a national championship caliber team. Doesn't mean they'll win it, but I think we can get to the point now where we can say it's a national championship caliber team." How about I, Doc Mike? You're familiar with him? I am. He says, uh, "Bring us some of those sausages." I love winning. Man, it's like better than losing. That's from a movie. He wants to, for us to name the movie. Uh, yeah, that is uh, Nuke Lelouch in uh, Bull Durham. Uh, Bull Durham, yeah. And then he says, love you, hearing you all so giddy. I'm having a 1989 vibe to this. Fun to have, to this point, the greatest single day in Aggie baseball history to happen on my 13th birthday, wow. April uh, 16th, 1989. Also cool to share that birthday distinction with uh, baseball enthusiast Scott Clendenin. Let's finish the job from 89, which they're celebrating here in a couple of weeks. At the ballpark, Hop was giving me some info on that. I know he talked about it on the board. So it is a, uh, it is fun, man. Like there's beyond just celebrating what they've done so far. If you haven't been part of the journey, if you're like one of those that follows on on tweets or follows on the thread, let's start watching it in person. Ideally. And if you're a bandwagoner, jump on. We want you here. Jump on. We want you here. And if you're listening. Any, in Atlanta or anywhere on the East Coast that you can get to uh, Tuscaloosa for that series, yeah. go make some noise there. Yeah. Go fill that ballpark up with our maroon. Do it. Do it. Do it. Um, <laughs> can we for a moment um, talk a little football? Is that okay oh, with you? There's never a bad time to talk Aggie football. Never a bad time. So a uh, couple things here. Uh, we have a couple of uh, Aggies going to have committed over the weekend, and I'm going to let Matthew Dawson give us the names and the particulars. One is a quarterback mm-hmm. that we are, are pretty excited about. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> you saw on Longstreet, a uh, four-star quarterback, top 50 recruit in the country, number one in California. I mean, there's some good quarterbacks that have come out of California Heck yeah. in the past years. And then we also picked up a four-star offensive lineman, Marcus Garcia, of uh, six foot five, two hundred twenty-five or 255 pounds, Top 50 offensive lineman in the country, number 27 in Texas, overall prospect. Excellent. Yeah. I love getting those alerts. It says Jason Howell, Ryan Braun. You know what I know. like? Uh, as far as offensive linemen, obviously nobody, uh, uh, you never know. But I like the guys that are around, coming out of high school, around 250 and 260. Yeah. That they're going to build up and make them, you know, 300 pounds of muscle and things. Like that. I like that um, some, sometimes – more than I like the bigger, sometimes more than I like the bigger. I mean, I celebrated Kenyon Green. It was a huge coming here. But uh, I like those guys that work hard to get to where they need to be. Also want to comment, uh, there was a report that uh, was out this weekend that uh, Jabari Barber has a foot injury and that he's going to have surgery. Uh, Billy did comment it on it on uh, techsags.com. We will talk to Billy about it, but uh, it's never good to, to lose somebody. And I don't think it changes what the plan was. There's, they were going to be open to to looking at uh, upgrading that position wherever they can, right. but it hurts. And, and well, do do we know that how long he's supposed to be out? No, we don't know that. Right. We don't so, know. Uh, but no, I hate that anybody's hurt, uh, especially kid working hard. And that's the thing about spring I think it's football. Jabri. Sorry, I don't think it's Jabari. I think no. it's Jabri. Sorry, that's just the thing about spring football. You know, a big part of it is, you know, you just want to get through it with this few injuries as possible and it's unfortunate that they have one yep another thing to add football wise jackie sherrill inducted into the texas sports yep. hall of fame this weekend props to him 
Uh, well just, deserved. Yeah, we, we need to get him on the show this week, too. With all the baseball stuff, we definitely need to talk to Coach Cheryl this week and, and talk about it. I'm going to tell you the class of 24, Jamal Charles, um, football, obviously, Andy mm-hmm. Cooper, uh, Roy Hoffines, oh, yeah, <laughs> Mr. Ho- uh, Mr. Hoffines, Barbara Jacket, Mike Leach went in mm-hmm. as well, Colt McCoy, okay. Jackie Cheryl, as I mentioned, Bubba Thornton, and uh, Krista Williams. That is your Texas Sports Hall of Fame class of 2024. As for Coach Cheryl, I remember, like, when I was becoming an Aggie in my mind, right? Like as a kid. Now I wasn't college age, but I was a kid. And I think I've told you the story before where I met him at uh, Walden, the, the golf course. And he, was, he couldn't have been nicer. He had this presence to him. He still has that presence. It's a strong voice and just, you know. And what he did with the, that program at that time, um, you know, made me a lifelong fan. He can shake your hand and hurt your hand if he wants to. Still, he's got meat hooks of hands. You still know? does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice guy. I really like him. I hated him back in the eighties because I was a Longhorns fan and he right. was making my life miserable. I always say I grew up a Longhorn fan and then I grew up. I stole that from somebody. Um, uh, actually, but I became a fan once I came down here in ninety three to cover him and the way everybody treated me here. Um, but uh, yeah, well deserved and you know for so many reasons. You know, he turned the A and M into a uh, into a perennial power and stuff. I mean, they what what they they won like what was it three straight SEC uh, SWC championships? Southwest Conference, yeah. Um, yeah, he did he did an amazing job. Beat Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl. Was that his team beat Auburn in the Cotton Bowl? But yeah, yeah, he, he did. Yeah, he, he did. Fantastic coach. And you know what? He's around the program still quite a bit. Yeah. When you think about some of the 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 legends of this program that we still get to see in RC all the time mm-hmm. and, and, and Coach Cheryl. Yeah. To, to me, like, again, they are what molded my, my love for Aggie football, both of those gentlemen. Like, I, Bucky Richardson was my first, like, college football idol, if you yeah. will. Like, mm-hmm. I remember, like, I wanted his jersey when the Oilers drafted him. I was like, he should be starting over Cody Carlson and over Warren Moon. Maybe Cody. <laughs> <laughs> when Bucky came in, good things happened at the Oilers. <laughs> Good thing happened for the Aggies. Yeah, when, absolutely. When so, but uh, yeah, so props to to uh, to Coach Cheryl, and he well deserved. We'll try to get him on the program this week. Maybe Bucky's next. Maybe you know what he might be. Yeah. All right, let's do this. We'll hit a break. We'll get to those text messages. I know many of you are catching up uh, right now. Though the future of medicine is here at QC Kinetics. They're the nation's leader in the most exciting revolution in pain management we've seen in decades. Really, like this is what a lot of people have been doing with a lot of money. Now it's available in this area for everyone. It's called regenerative medicine. And if you're tired of those achy joints, uh, that joint pain is keeping you from doing what you love to do. Well, then you need to reach out to the good folks there at QC Kinetics because they're going to get you moving once again with no surgery, no steroids, no drugs. Those aren't your best options. In fact, let's consider other options out there like regenerative medicine. They're transforming lives with innovative treatments that deliver lasting results by using your natural body biologics, right? And they're going to use your own power to repair and restore that damaged tissue out there. And by the way, Dr. Mitchell Sheinkup is the uh, leader of the National, National Medical Director for them. He's a pioneer in the field with 20 years of clinical work and tons of research. And he wants to get you relief with a needle, not with a knife. So call QC Kinetics to learn more about this exciting option, a revolutionary approach that can get you long-term relief with no downtime. It is QC Kinetics. Call them up for a free consultation, 979-452-6000. QC Kinetics, 979-452-6000. That is 979-452-6000.
I'm looking at their website right now. Hey, Olin, how you doing? Good. How oh, you? good. Just checking in. Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. So the, the best part about having all these people all in on baseball, right? They start noticing some flaws in the program, and they're, they're right. People write, why don't you have, I'm just using this voice, he's, not, he's very nice. Why don't you have a baseball helmet on the set since they're the number one team in the country of, instead of two footballs in the offseason? See what we do? We say, you know what, you're right. Olin's going to get up. He's going to go get that. You know, I'm going to tell you why. I don't know if you know this. This is not a Hollywood production. This is a College Station production. So we don't have 29 people on the set. Uh, we sometimes forget to change it, you know. <laughs> like, but you're right. This team deserves it. You know what? We'll put a basketball right back here. We'll put some track shoes or a baton. We'll put a tennis racket. In fact, we won't even use hosts. We'll use AI and the rest of the set. Well, slow down there, big guy. You it's know, coming. I, I, it's I still, coming. I still got to get through. Uh, I still got one more with two more years in college. I am Olin Buchanan. Welcome to the show. That's coming. Could an AI come up with some of the stupid things I say on the air, though? They won't be stupid. No, they won't be stupid. They won't be. <laughs> People right. you are correct there. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Mr. Dawson, get us some text messages, please. Absolutely. Uh, here's one from Chase in Houston, actually. It's my he guy. Said, well, he believes that Texas A&M is going to win the national championship. He's going to win the national championship. I hope he's right. And I'll update you on some fan or some DraftKings odds. Arkansas is first in odds at plus 550, so five and a half to one to win okay. a national championship. Texas A&M is second and tied with Tennessee at plus 800. So mm. eight to one odds. What is that, about 16%? No, no, way less than that. 13% chance that we have uh, a winning the national championship according to odds makers in Vegas. How does that feel? You know what? I can't uh, handle that pressure, so yeah. what I do is I put my head down and I just win each series, right? That's like, right. One series at a time, which sounds so like... Coach, uh, like, coach speak. It does. But it's true. But there's a reality to that. If you think to, now as a fan... This team is absolutely capable of winning a national championship, and I would I, I wouldn't bet against them, right? But, Sound like Jack Moss. Yeah, you're right. We probably need to get a quote from somebody <laughs> this year's team for the intro, but um, hopefully when they get to the uh, hey, I can't give you that. They can't actually. No, oh. they're gonna say sounds like Jack Moss. <laughs> they're they're gonna sounds f- like Jack Moss. Yeah, you know, I did that voice because that's the robotic version, but AI is pretty sophisticated where they can make. You say anything, Ob. Could they make references to Kay Nately? You could type in whatever you wanted to say, and it'll find a way. Mm. So that could be dangerous for you, buddy. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm almost at the end of the string, right? It's, it's all right. What else, Dawson? Chad, the texture says, if you have not seen the shot interview from last night, it's a great watch. He talks nothing about baseball, <laughs> but the dude is witty. <laughs> it helped me understand why they kept playing the Rattlin' Bog 36 times over the weekend. He had never even heard this song before, but the students seemed to like it. Sounds like a real fun team to cover. A lot of personalities yeah. and a lot of good guys. Absolutely. I, I think, too, like when the vibes are high in the locker room and that dugout, you know, like there's a certain elevation of talent. Well, you have your talent level, right? But then you have your chemistry and you play together. Yeah. It's awesome to see like guys like Hayden Shot keeping it together. Also, too, if there's any marketing team members of uh, Olsen Field and Bluebell, like listening to Tech Tech Radio right now, if you want to sell out of beer, Okay, the Rattling Bog, it's traditionally a college kid song where, you know, you, you drink in the, in the long section. So, so basically you're telling them to sell to the guys that probably can't, uh, aren't legally uh, yeah. allowed to buy you, it. You, so want, you want Aggie baseball to break Obviously, the law. Obviously, the these kids have to be 21, 22, 23 years old. There's, there's so many students Obviously, at Obviously, they don't have to be. I know this for a fact. <laughs> but but at Olsen Field, they do have to well, be. In Baton Rouge, they don't anyway. Oh, different. If you want to see fact, a I think spike, they're required to be drunk. If you want to see a spike in beer sales, that's... Well, I'm saying, you know what I need to do is get really serious about uh, expanding that field. Yeah, it's got to happen. Like I said, I wanted to buy tickets, but I couldn't. You know, I didn't want to sit on the lawn. I wanted an actual seat, and they, you know, they they weren't available. Yep, it's coming. I feel good about that. Matthew, let's try to get another one in. Um, absolutely. David in Temple says, Olin, all the stupid things you say on air increases the intelligence of your fans. There you go. That's unbelievable. There you Why go. would someone say that? You, right. you have the greatest what, what wordplay is, what of is all time. What is stupid to me, I'm so smart that when I'm stupid, you get smarter. How well, does that make any sense? <laughs> How does that make any sense? <laughs> also, too, you have some of the best wordplay. Like, I have to have my mic on silence over here because I'm sometimes I giggle over here a little bit. 
Hmm. I giggle. Blake says, I believe in this Tamu, this Tamu team is terrifying for opponents. I believe they're the best team in college baseball. The best team does not usually win at all. Let's be the type of fans that cheer on the team to fulfill their yeah. full potential. Yeah. But be sure they maybe stumble, but let's not falter. Let's have fun. Let's, let's have, have fun. fun. Do it. Do it. Hey, so what was it 11 days ago, whenever they were about to go to South Carolina, we looked at this stretch like it'd be great to win these next two series. Not only have they won these next two series, they've dominated. Right, Man. and it's there's still a lot to go, and I hate prefacing everything. That's the facts. But this team, nobody in the country wants to face. Let's be honest. Like you don't want to face. I mean, you want to face the number one team, of course. But like this is the kind of team. Like where's the weakness? It must be really stressful to pitch against them. Okay, got this guy. Oh my gosh, here comes Lovelette. Oh okay, okay, okay. Oh my gosh, here comes Montgomery. Oh my gosh, here comes Apel. I have a dear friend who says what uh, Vanderbilt should have done is hit uh, Gavin Grahovic to start the series to maybe cause fear in the hearts of the Aggie baseball lineup. Uh, no. Well, they tried it with Lavalette, La right? <laughs> but the fear is facing those guys. Yes. OB, thank you, buddy. Yes, you're welcome. When we come back, Jim Schlossnagel, Ryan Broninger, your text messages and life.
The rattling bog, Bronny. Seems like I'm not on. There, there you go. go. It seems like it's here to stay. It was, it was cool. Great vibe. Great work this weekend. Uh, Ryan Broninger with us here on Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the hotline. We're joined by Jim Schlossnagel here on Tex Ags Radio. Schloss, good morning, sir. How are you? I'm doing well, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Um, appreciate you guys reminding me of that song <laughs> uh, this morning. <laughs> well, I've been hear, hearing it in my sleep, which is actually, I, I guess that's a good thing. Well, let's go over this weekend. This morning we find out uh, the number one team in the country, Texas A&M, just the success of the weekend, the season so far, the stakes are getting harder, obviously. Just uh, your overall thoughts on things, uh, how things have played out. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously feel good about our record, feel good about where we are halfway through the SEC season. So you um, you try to uh enjoy it for a second um actually you know what i'm trying to enjoy is just the relationships with the players and the overall experience of our games um but we also respect the game itself and the league every opponent including air force tomorrow um and you know that at the end of the day the, you know the regular season we'd love to win a championship but that at the end of the day you're trying to keep your team moving forward, keep improving, keep them healthy, um, and try to be, if we are fortunate to be in a postseason, to, to have your team be at its best or at least healthy enough to be at its best uh, when it gets here. So, um, you know, we can't get, we can't get drunk with, with uh, rankings and all that kind of stuff because it, you know, it literally has no value other than it, that it brings – deserve notoriety to the program coach i think when you go back and look at the week and specifically the weekend everybody's going to look at uh they want to talk about those those blowout wins on friday and saturday but i want to talk about yesterday and getting down four to nothing your decision to go to the pen early even though i thought you know lampkin had a little bit of bad luck with that uh, the double play would have gotten him out of that inning but uh just cortez and, and your continued growing confidence in him and I like what you said after the game. You, like you feel like he's in a good space mentally, and you're going to keep him in that bullpen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Justin. Uh, let's talk about Justin first. I think he, yeah, he had some luck, but he also you know, he didn't really have uh, his changeup. It's really most days it's his best secondary pitch, and I, and I don't know that he threw one in the strike zone. Um, and then he had a couple flare hits. Uh, we threw a ball away in the center field. Um, gave up a home run to the one guy on the team. Well, not necessarily the one guy with the wind blowing out, but the one big physical player in Holcomb. Uh, and you know, sometimes, you know, you're a victim of being the guy, the third game guy when, when the other teams in, you know, they're super desperate to win. So, uh, but yeah, Cortez was awesome. Um, really good to see him do that two times in a row. Uh, he was pitching, I think he was on fumes there towards the end, even though he's touching the upper 90s, but uh, he did a great job. And he does, you know, I think uh, Zane's question after the game was a valid one because that's your every general baseball fan's first thought would be, you know, should we look at his role being different? And I think what the fans don't get to be a part of is the mindset of the player and where their comfort level is, right? So um, I think right now he's in a good space, and I don't think we would want to mess with that. Um, if, it, if it were to ever be needed, at least he has the experience of starting a game. Um, but kind of like Ashley Beck right now, you would love for him to be available, if not two times in a weekend, at least two times in a week. Yeah, and then your decision, you, you said it a bunch, the biggest decision you make is when to bring Evan in. So just kind of take me through his usage throughout the weekend, and then was there any thought yesterday when you guys scored that 12th run to, to sit him down and have somebody else go for the night? Yes, there was. Um, our thought was that we were just going to have him get uh, that Vastine guy. So Vanderbilt, they, you know, they only have the one left-handed hitter, and he hits – he was hitting 087 going into the weekend against the lefties. Um, and he's actually, he, he has the most extra base hits on their team. 
Um, so he's actually got pretty good power. Um, and I just didn't want to give them a chance to get something started. I've been, especially where the wind's blowing and you have a chance to, I mean, that's a winning the series. That's why we do what we did sat, you know, Saturday is I'm just, I'm just not risking anything. And then, so I, the plan was to just have him pitch against Bastine and then he got him out on one pitch and I was like, okay, let's see how quickly he can do this. And then they swung at the next first pitch and I'm like, well, golly. And he said he had come back in the dugout and said, I wanted to finish this. And so, uh, we had Rudis ready to go. Um, you know, we wanted to save every pitch. If I had to do it over again, once he gave up the homer, I would have taken him out. But um, I don't know. I was just, I was excited for Evan in the moment. Uh, but if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have started anybody else in the inning. Um, but I would have maybe gotten him out after he got the first two outs, so that because we do have a short short uh, week uh, this week in terms of rest. Shalos, we asked you something similar last week uh, after the Sunday game against South Carolina. Just talk to me about players' mindset going into an opportunity to sweep that this team is is never finished, right? Uh, they they see blood in the water, they go after it. They do. I, I, well, I I mean, I wish you could be in the dugout with them. There isn't a um, there aren't emotional highs or lows. So when we're winning, um, they don't take it for granted they just play when we're losing they don't panic they just play and that's you know that's just the one thing I challenge them with all year especially once we get off to a good start is is how mature can you be and in other words um you see teams play great on weekends and bad on Tuesdays and and and, and that can just be baseball or a lack of depth of pitching you know, that can be baseball-related stuff, which we've all been uh, been a part of in years past. Or um, what I never wanted to be is a lack of what I call immaturity, where you don't prepare the right way. You, you let a, a, a success or failure on a Sunday affect the next game. And I know it sounds coachy, but it truly is an opening day mentality. I want them to take the confidence that comes from winning, right? Because game is such a game of, I mean, baseball is such a game of, of confidence, right? And um, I want them to take the confidence, but I don't want, to, want, want them to ever assume anything. And, and, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been doing this for 35 plus years, and I know how fleeting all of this can be. You know, you can, I mean, I've been, I coached a team one year at TCU where we were hanging around 500 and our season was on the ropes and we go to Texas and sweep Texas when they were number one or two in the country. And we went to the world series and we flipped our season around and we, and we've seen plenty of teams that have great regular seasons, but don't play well in the postseason. So the mindset of a coach, the mindset of a coach is it's probably not very healthy, but it is what it is you're always just moving on to the next game. Coach, talk a little bit of the baseball stuff. I, I've never seen Ali Camarillo hit a home run to center field, and then we asked him in the post game. That was the first time he hit a ball out to center field, but it, it kind of speaks to what you said. Like He's getting outputs on game days that are greater than what y'all saw in any fall practice or, or inner squad. Is that a – think that's a product of a guy just playing to the lights, or it's a product of, of some of the work maybe he's done with Josh Kiesel? Uh, I think it's everything. I think it's, uh, if you look at a side angle view of his swing, and I know you and I have talked about this, if you would look at a side angle view of him now versus when he showed up here or versus him last year at Northridge, it's not even the same hitter. Mike Early has done an unbelievable job in, of, of transforming his approach and his physical setup. And, of course, Ali's to be credited for do, actually doing it and buying in. Um, Josh is to be credited for getting him stronger. Uh, he's actually hit balls that hard to that part of the field this year. Um, I'm not going to tell you the wind blew that ball out of the ballpark, but I think it may have been the difference between it hitting the fence and going out. Um, but Ollie, you know, if you watch him, he and I had a conversation, uh, after his last at bat 
before the homer, and I said, man, your competitiveness is what makes you great, but you can't let that over go over a threshold to where you swing in a bad pitch with two strikes, right? You, you, you'll watch him swing, and he fouls a ball straight back, and if you watch his body language, he's, he's, like, he's so upset that he missed that pitch. He's got to flush it and move on to the next pitch, and sometimes he gets so competitive that he's in, in fight mode instead of being in control of himself. And he, if you remember, when he chased that pitch up for strike three. Um, and those are the balls we need him to lay off of. But, but yeah, I mean, Ali's, Ali's so, he, he's so fun to be around and obviously an elite defender and really good base runner too. Were, were you surprised, not surprised because we know the talent of this offense, but I mean, Vanderbilt rolled out some real arms this weekend and real arms out of the bullpen – on Sunday, and I know there's some of them are young, but I'm sitting there watching these these kids run in and going, man, these look like front end SEC starters, whether it's this year or down the road. And I thought your guys really did a good job within the game adjusting to what the Vanderbilt arms were doing. Yeah, we did. Uh, Mike's really, really good at giving the guys a plan. Um, I mean, Carter, that was named yesterday, Gracie yes. Carter. Uh, I mean, he, he, I mean, he was their Friday night starter last week, right? Or the week before. Um, guy's throwing 100 miles an hour and started sticking his breaking ball, which he doesn't normally do. Um, and then we get down 4 nothing, and you're like, oh, baby, here we go. And then McElvain is just, he's going to pitch in the big leagues for a long time as a left-handed reliever. And then they just kept bringing the lefties, which is, I mean, all good left-handed pitching is normally tough on any team. And we did a nice job with them. That You know, they gave us the extra out on the ground ball. But uh, all of that was because of you know Cortez and and how we how we played defense and and also uh, how Jackson Appel caught. I mean, catching Cortez is not a lot of fun. Um, the ball's going all over the place, uh, and then he gets a lot of really tough foul balls because of his sinker. And Jackson took a tough one uh, yesterday. It, it didn't hit any part of his equipment. He got it right in the mid thigh. So I'm sure he's pretty pretty uh sore today but but yeah those vanderbilt's awesome i mean you'll look up next week and and they'll be doing great just like they did against lsu last week and and alabama uh you know our next opponent in conference is a great team too they pitch their rear end off um they have a potential first or second round pick on friday night and they have a kid that pitched awesome yesterday that we we tried hard uh, to get him to change his mind. Uh, he's from Houston area, Zane Adams, and uh, I think he threw eight, like two hit innings or something yesterday. So um, these games are every weekend's a super regional. So we just got to be ready for him. Schloss, can you speak to Travis Chestnut, uh, his growth this year, and the multiple options he provides for you all? Yeah, Travis. You know, it's, it's the you know it's the same thing. You know, we. We've seen what he's capable of doing when he gets on the bases. Um, he's always been a pretty good defender at second base. Travis's challenge on, he's so twitchy and so fast, and his mind actually moves at the same speed as his feet, which isn't always great. Um, so he's got to, on defense, you know, it's a challenge for him to play under control, but he can really turn a double play when he's under control. And then he made an awesome play on that chopper over the mound uh, to end an inning yesterday. And then offensively, it's just a matter, you know, he is finally, uh, Mike, myself, we sat him down and said, hey, man, if you're going to play, and, I, and I'll just be honest with you guys, if you remember Johnny Long, or everybody knows who he is now because he's a pretty controversial player, but the, uh, the catcher for Mississippi State, how he spreads out and stands right on top of home plate. Um, we, we just told Chestnut, hey, man, like you just got to – your job is to – if you can somehow get on base twice a game, no matter how that is, and play good defense, then you can bring something to our team that we don't have. And it's a dynamic that's not in too many lineups, but it's certainly not in ours. And, you know, he has bought into that. So I think he got hit by a pitch yesterday. Uh, he had a bunt hit. Um, so that's the kind of player – you know, that's the kind of player we need there. You know, the, the cool thing, the other cool thing he does for us is, let's say Sorrell's on first base. 
with two out, you know, normally you don't want to run and have your nine hole hitter lead off the next inning. But if Travis is going to be able to get on base, then that opens our up our ability to, to be a little more aggressive on the base. Speaking of leadoff hitters, Gavin Grahovic with another really good week. But I, I want to talk about the maturity of his game, Coach. And where I saw it shine the most was in the double steal yesterday where Vanderbilt knew they had no shot to throw Travis Chestnut out at third. But it's imperative that the trail runner get a really good jump in that situation or he's going to be out because they're not going to throw at Travis. And Gavin got an A-plus jump and beat that throw and set up Jace for an RBI spot. Set your, you guys up for two RBIs yeah. on, on no hits in that inning. Correct. So we actually talked about that um, in the pregame uh, on Saturday because there was a time, I think it was Friday or it might have been Saturday, they all run together for me. There was a time when Jace Lavalette was up, they were playing the shift, and the third baseman was way over in the six hole, and the, but the pitcher had a really quick leg time. So when they were playing that third baseman over in the six hole, um, what they were telling us is you can have third base, but we're throwing the second base. And so um, I didn't have a sign or necessarily a way. I was trying to get Mike's attention, but I was trying to get Mike's attention and their, their attention to say, hey, if Chestnut goes, tell, uh, what's his name, Grahovic, uh, not to run because he would have been thrown out on a one-two leg time. There was no way Chestnut was going to get thrown out, even with Lavalette being left-handed hitter opened up. There was no way the third baseman was going to be able to get to the base. So we had that conversation, and when they made the pitching change, the difference was the big lefty Green had a big longer leg, so his time to the plate was around one five. So I knew I said, Gavin, if, if if Travis decides to go, you go ahead and go because you'll make it um, because because of the you know longer leg of the of the pitcher. But yes, that was a massive play. It was actually my favorite sequence of the whole weekend because then Lavalette hit the sack fly, uh, Grahovic got the third base on the sack fly, and then we had the contact play and which, which we practice every single day, and that shortstop totally expected to have a play at home and because we ran that contact play perfectly he didn't have a choice but to throw the ball to first base schloss we appreciate your time here on this uh, monday morning thanks so much and we'll talk to you here on thursday all right guys have a great day gig him gig him thank you very much thank you one thing i didn't get to ask him about and Brian, i'll ask you about it on the other side i mean it's not even a question it's just commentary people are coming people are supporting the biggest second biggest crowd uh, there for for Olson Field this weekend. It it lends credence to the expand Olson. Mm-hmm. And you're starting to see it a lot more on social media too. And uh, for anybody wondering, I, I do think those based off what we've heard, those conversations are moving in the right direction. Good. We'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, some baseball with Bronny for another segment. Right now, Millican Reserve Time. They're a farm to table community. You can find them in College Station if you're coming down the Houston way. You know you'll find it on your left hand side there between Navasota and obviously College Station. If you're coming off of Welburn, look on your left hand side. You'll you'll see it's awesome. Dedicated to the conservation of a healthy community. Open spaces all over the place, right? It's the kind of place that you want to live in nature. That's the place you go to. 2,600 acres of open space, 30 miles of trails, and farms. They want to connect families to nature. They want to connect you to each other, right? That's what they do there at Millican Reserve. Such a great, great place. Um, They're an unheralded place for families to cherish after generation and generation. And they want to maintain and restore that natural habitat where you can find all the animals you want there in the woods, the ponds, the creeks out there. You got the white tailed deers, you got the sombers, you got the rabbits, you got the turtles. And then the homeowners at Millican Reserve sharing a legacy of conservation, which means generation after generation, you're coming back to that same place, that uh, pristine countryside place where you can go explore and you can go discover. You can go hiking there, biking, canoeing, kayaking, equestrian trails, the evening yoga, the summer camps, the music festivals, the farmer markets, and the farm tours. Join them there at MillicanReserve.com. Again, that website, MillicanReserve.com.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sacks Radio. It's presented by David Gardner Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. We have Ryan Broniger in studio to break down a little bit more baseball. What I love, Bronny, and um, you can see it in the numbers, people on YouTube are, are just eating up baseball talk uh, on TechSacks.com. They want more of it. It's, it's, they're starving for the, uh, for the content because of the success that we're seeing on the field. Well, and I think the crowds over the weekend would also support that, right? Yeah. I mean, the, they were sensational Friday and Saturday, a little bit late arriving on Sunday, but still a really good crowd. And um, I, I think they enjoyed the Sunday game as much as any of them because they had to battle back. And mm-hmm. uh, the roof went off the place whenever Camarillo hit the three-run home run to cap off that six-run fifth inning. But, man, it's almost like the combination of the A&M talent, the A&M team, and the crowd just overwhelmed Vanderbilt on Friday night. Uh, it was – and really the entirety of the weekend, they took apart Vanderbilt in every facet of the game. And I'm not an Aggie baseball historian. You'd probably have to ask Scott Clendenin, but I don't remember them doing that to a top 10 team. And I've seen them win top 10 series at home, yep. but I don't remember the, them just taking apart, dismantling a, a team in a program like Vanderbilt. And there were some things that happened over the weekend where I was like, man, that's just super good from A&M. And there's also some things that happened over the weekend where I was like, Vanderbilt's quitting. They don't want to do it anymore. They don't want to compete at the high level anymore. I saw it on Saturday on a couple of occasions to the point where I was looking in the dugout to see if Tim Corbin was going to say something to, to his players. And I don't need to call those kids out, but there was just some things that if you're – if you're watching with a keen baseball eye, you saw some things happen. You're like, man, that that's a good sign for AM. Like they're making Vanderbilt quit. And it's not going to be like that in every SEC no. weekend, but it, it, I think it was. I think it was a combination of the team and the crowd that just overwhelmed the Commodores. You know what it felt like to me, Bronny? It's like me watching them. Is this really my team? Like you see what the Golden State Warriors did, the Dodgers run a few years, but whatever. All these teams, right? You watch greatness happen. And I'm watching my team do that exact thing that I crave. And it's happening in real time as I'm watching it. It's hard for me to kind of believe it. Yeah, it was kind of like, I think for A&M fans, you, you think back to Johnny beating Oklahoma like that in the Cotton Bowl. Yeah. Like, is this? Is this real? Yeah. Like, it just, and we'd seen Johnny do it so much, much like we've seen this baseball team. Like, they continue to give us data points, man. And like I said last week, you can't ignore it at this point. Like, Talent, duh. But grit, toughness, togetherness, unity, cohesion, synergy, all those words to describe the vibes of a dugout and the, just the willingness to play hard for each other. And look, on Friday night with the game well in hand, they had two hustle doubles late in that game, where it was probably the sixth inning, where Teddy Burton for sure was one of them. Like the game's in hand. They're going to run roll Vanderbilt on Friday night. And he hits a ball down the line, and he does not stop. He's running hard out of the box, and it's a hustle double. Like, that is why you're successful over the long term in the game of baseball. I can't tell you how many times I watch high school baseball players with no offers, uncommitted, they get a single in a summer league game, and they dog it to first base. Mm. And they wonder why they're uncommitted and they don't have offers. But I watch guys that are 23 years old playing at the SEC level in a blowout game that they know they're going to win, and they're busting it out of the box for late doubles, late hustle doubles in SEC games. Like So they're, the game knows. The game will pay you back for playing it the proper way. And what I said to Andrew Monaco last night at the end of the broadcast in the postgame show was like, there's adversity coming for this team. It's just inevitable – for every baseball team ever. I mean, it, you don't know when it's going to come, but how you handle that adversity will go a long way to determine of what the, the end of the season looks like. Nobody cares about being number one in April. It's cool. It's really cool, and it's well-deserved. They look and play like the best team in the country. Yep. But in the end, it's about being number one in June and being in Omaha with a chance to, to raise a real trophy. And look, I, they probably want to win an SEC title. They'd be sick. They they might even want to win an SEC tournament title. But I, what I think is, if you get to the SEC tournament and you look like you're 
going to be a national seed, whatever happens in Hoover, you're just you're happy with. Right, right. Uh, but you know, but for last year's team, that would have been a really cool uh, trophy to have was that SEC tournament, and Vanderbilt beat you in the final. Um, but more important than the number to the left of their name is the number to the right of their name, meaning their record. And Shosh said that, like you're pleased with the record. The goal is not to go into the postseason being number one. That who cares? Like, honestly, who cares about being number one in college baseball? It doesn't mean anything. And now you're starting to see it in college basketball. Who cares? I mean, it worked for UConn, but does it always work out that way? No. You want to be number one at the end. Right. That's it. And what I'm saying is you want to be playing at a level that you wrap up postseason baseball at Bluebell Park. That's the goal. So keep winning SEC series. You're 11-4 and four at the halfway point. If you play 500 baseball in the league, you could say even one under 500 – so you go seven and eight in the back half of the season. That puts you at eighteen and twelve in the league. That's going to get you a at least a regional host for sure, probably a national host playing five hundred baseball. That's not the goal. That's not what they're planning That's on just doing. The reality of the situation. But because of how you've played so far the, throughout the, the first half of conference play, you've you've given yourself a little bit of wiggle room. Remember, right. you're trying to win series at home, and you're trying not to get swept on the road. Anything that you do greater than that is a plus in that column. So they've got two sweeps. That's two pluses. They've got a, a road series win. That's a plus. You know, so if they just hold serve the rest of the way, they're, they're going to be plus three. You're looking at 15 and 15 as your 500 mark, right? Mm -hmm. Don't lose series on the road. Win them, win them at home. That puts you at 15 and 15. You're in the NCAA tournament. You might even host at that because of the, what your RPI will look like. So where your pluses come from? Well, there's those two series sweeps. There's that road series. So now you're at 18 If you eighteen conference wins if you just play 500 ball the rest of the way. I don't think they'll do that. But I'm talking about just the work that they've done up to this point has given them some wiggle room so that they do have some adversity. It's not season-ending adversity from here on out. Last thing before I cut you loose. Ryan Prager on Friday, I asked for him to set a tone. He freaking set a tone, didn't he? Well, and he set a tone, and it was the bell was answered then on Saturday. And I think – Look, I don't want to dismiss what Ryan Prager did. He's been brilliant, and he's he's right up there with Hagen Smith at Arkansas for the best pitchers in this league. But I thought the story of the weekend was Tanner Jones. Absolutely, he was great. on Saturday. And if if that's the Tanner Jones that's going to show up more often than not, then you're sure as heck not going to go seven and eight down the back half of this conference stretch. Um, he was dynamite, and. Prager hands him the ball, pitching the way Prager has, and then he sets that tone. If you get Justin Lampkin going, and I'm not ready to write him off, and I thought what was really cool yesterday with when Lampkin exited the game, the, the team response in the dugout. They all met him at the top step, patted him on the butt, and said, you're okay, we got you. And, and Chris Cortez obviously helped that. But the team understands, the coaching staff understands that they need Justin Lampkin. They're going to need him to pitch well. So, okay, he's had a couple of bad ones, whatever. He, he was also sensationally good. At, was it against Mississippi State? Yeah. And he's been good at times throughout the season. So, you can't just write him off and, and dump him out of that Sunday role. And, by the way, what Jim Schlossnagel said about Chris Cortez, you need to listen to it. You can't just, oh, he's pitching great, put him in that Sunday role. Some guys, the coaching, this coaching staff especially, they understand the mindset of a player better than anybody. What if Chris Cortez doesn't like starting games? And what if he's figuring that out? What if the coaching staff has figured out that he doesn't do well knowing when he's going to pitch? Like all the preparation, the right. like he's like kind of the anticipatory anxiousness that comes with that. What if he doesn't do well with that? And you're better off putting him in the bullpen and he doesn't know when he's going to get the ball. And he functions he just better. just rea reacts. Yeah, yeah, just functions. So you can't just say, oh, he's pitching better than Lampkin and he needs to go to Sunday. It doesn't work like that. No, it does not. You're 32 and four. Is it, or is it 33 and four? I think it's 32. 32 and four. Yep. Why don't you trust the guys making the decisions? Ball up what you're doing, keep it going. Yeah, don't tinker with it, right? I mean, some small things here and there, if you've got to, you know, depending on situation in the game, to make some bullpen decisions, I understand. It'll be interesting to see who gets the ball tomorrow against yeah. Air Force. Weston Moss didn't throw all weekend. I think that's a real option to get him start a, a start because you're still searching for who would be that fourth starter. If you love Cortez in a bullpen role, what happens if you lose a game in a regional and you're going to have to start somebody else? Could Weston Moss be that guy? Yep. So anyway, there's a lot to talk about. I have no idea how I'm going to type a recap of this weekend. 
Um, but uh, maybe just a stream of consciousness thing. But you could legitimately go through the starting nine and the pitchers that we saw this weekend and write something up about every single one of them. That's how good A&M was. Ronnie, thank you, buddy. Thank you. When we come back, the Association of Former Students in studio here. We'll talk to Scott here in a moment. Right now, a moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet. You can find them online. Go to CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. Let's talk about the process. When you're looking for a new vehicle, the steps, right? Many of you will start online. That's why I highly recommend going to CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. And then you're going to go to the lot, and you're going to take a look. You're going to maybe test drive a couple of vehicles. Go somewhere that you know that the service is going to be great. It's going to be real easy. And obviously, the quality, right? The quality of the, the service, the quality of the people. People, the quality of the entire experience. That's why you go to CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com. Get a good uh, trade-in value, get great pricing, and again, just an overall excellent experience. We're talking about the entire process from beginning to end, even after, right? We're talking about the uh, complimentary pickup for their service customers and obviously the complimentary return of that vehicle. They do it all there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet, and it's not a far drive. We're talking about 15 minutes to the very edge of Brian, right? at the edge to the beginnings of Caldwell. Short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell, online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com.
All right, we're going around the associations. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Huge uh, audience today for baseball. So we're going to talk some Aggie Muster there. Our buddy Scott Walker in the house, class of 90. How are you, sir? Doing great. Thanks for having us back. Thank you, buddy. And Tracy Collins, uh, class of 25, external relations coordinator, student muster committee. What's up, Tracy? How's it going? So tell me a little bit about the the space. So a little bit fun fact. I'm a Space Force cadet with the Corps of Cadets. Um, I got into that in my sophomore year. I was going out for Air Force, learned that I hated flying, and decided to put my name in the bucket. My dad's friend highly encouraged it, and uh, it just became something now, and we'll be one of the first people to commission in the Space Force out of Texas A&M. How awesome is that, man? Are you pumped? It's, I'm absolutely thrilled. It's going to be a great time. I'm just excited to serve in any way possible, and that includes here on campus, the nation, whatever whatever it may be. How's your family think about it? They love it. My yeah. dad's 24 years retired Navy. My sister's a Marine currently serving in Norway. So uh, big family ties when it comes to military and all that. So any way that we can serve is kind of what we like to do. I love to hear that. Scotty, let's talk about muster coming up here, obviously, April 21st, 7 o'clock, Reed Arena, uh, hosted by uh, at the Clayton W. Williams Jr. Alumni Center, I should say. And uh, let's talk a little bit about all the events you're putting together and how busy you're going to be. Oh, oh, by the way, you were just super busy. Yeah, we had we had a few friends over last yeah. week. Um, yes, the traffic was our fault, uh, but we we also take credit for the economic impact of rain day. Yeah, <laughs> right. So they were in the restaurants and the hotels. But, it's great for the community. Um, yeah, but you know those are those are it's it's two traditions: ring day, the ring itself, right. and Aggie muster that are absolutely unique. There's nothing like either one of those anywhere, and it really goes to to the heart of what it is to be an Aggie. Um, Muster, my boss likes to always say that muster is the one tradition that every Aggie is guaranteed to participate in, whether you like it or not. Yeah, it's true. Somebody's going to call your name someday. Somebody's going to say here for you. Um, so it'll start uh, at sunrise, actually, on um, Sunday, which okay. is muster day. And we will start with the worldwide muster roll call. So back in late 17, early 2018, we decided to do some some research on the true history of muster. Um, a lot of things at A and M, the history is just oral history passed sure. down from one to the uh, one one class to the next. We wanted to see what could actually be documented. One of the things we learned was that never in in history had there been a muster where they called every name of every Aggie who had passed in the past year. A lot of people think. That used to be the case on campus, that when A&M was smaller, they would call the name of, of everybody who passed in the, in the most recent year. Turns out that's actually never been the case. And so if there's nobody that's calling every name, there's a risk that a name might, might get missed. That's not acceptable. So we created the worldwide muster, the live worldwide muster roll call, and we call every name on the annual roll. Generally 1,400 to 1,600 names. Um, and we call every one of them. We say here for every one of them. Uh, we start that at sunrise. We have volunteers who come in and read names and, and say here. Uh, we stream all of this, tx.ag slash muster live. Uh, you can time shift it. So if you don't want to get up at sunrise or you're, you know, maybe you're commuting at that time, you can come later in the day and watch it. Um, you can also go online and, and you can do virtual reflection. So you can un upload a photo or comment about somebody that is on the roll. And um, you can say here virtually. And that's just the beginning of muster day. That's like the first two and a half hours. Um, there's musters going on all around the world. Of course, the most famous, most well-known is the one that's happening in Reed Arena. You know, well, let's talk about that, uh, Tracy, and tell, tell us a little bit on, on the student side. Yeah, so muster begins for us at 7 a.m. Um, on Friday, actually. So that's when we have our flag reading ceremony in the Academic Plaza, um, and it's in honor of the Class of 74. So the entire Corps will get out there. All students are welcome to participate and come uh, watch the flag get raised. And then later that day, we have our events starting with the uh, reunion class barbecue or class 74. Join us, our current students and any family, friends uh, for some camaraderie. And we let everybody come out. There's some good barbecue, Cane's chicken fingers out there. So there's going to be some good eating, some live performances from 11 to 2 p.m. Um, and it's it's just a good time to hear some some old good bull stories. And then Campus muster for us, of course, on committee starts a little bit earlier than everybody else. But, of course, we, we part on and, and prepare for the entire month and the entire year to put on the Reed Arena ceremony starting at 7 p.m. Doors open at 5 p.m. for people to come sit down. Um, seating is first come, first serve. So get there as soon as possible so that you can see as much as you possibly can. 
Uh, our speaker is going to be fantastic. I've had the blessed opportunity to meet him several times. It's Major General Retired Tim Green. Uh, he's class of 86, and he's currently the director of the Bush Combat Development Complex. He's going to have an amazing speech, and you can always view it live at tx.ag slash muster live as well. So yeah. the association is going to be proud to support us there. It's going to be an amazing time. I'm super thrilled to not only be able to serve the community in this in this part, but also put this on for the families that, that we're honoring because it is truly a special tradition that, like you said, nowhere else has. Scott, one thing that is apparent every time you bring a student to studio, they speak better than I do as the host of the show. <laughs> it's intimidating and it's also exciting about the future of Aggies that are coming Absolutely. down the pipeline. That, that, that's awesome uh, stuff there, Tracy. Let's, let's talk about the, uh, the other musters. We got a bunch. Yeah, so that's a good transition because uh, muster is a massive lift and it is a partnership. Obviously, the association is deeply involved. Student muster committee uh, does so much work, but there are musters going on across the planet. We know there's 264 musters that have been registered. That was a, as of last week. I'm sure it's more than that by now. Um, some of those are put on by A&M clubs. Some of them are just Aggies in a community who are getting together. Um, sometimes it's it's three people, you know, in a, in a famously in a foxhole. Um, yeah. So um, one of the largest musters other than the campus muster um, is, is the Brazos County A&M club muster, which will happen – uh, the same evening at 6 p.m. over at Legends Event Center. Have you been there? It's Man, awesome. That it's is, so cool to be there. What yeah. a great addition to yeah. this community. It's been yeah. fantastic to go yeah. out there. And um, great location to have have a muster. Uh, Bowen Lofton is their speaker, so oh. that'll be a draw for sure. Class That's 21, cool. former president of the university, of course. Uh, very well known, Aggie. Um, but uh, we support all of those. So we we print and send postcards. We send emails. We provide the lists. So each... Each muster calls its own list of people who are connected to that area or to the people at that muster in some way. And so we keep, we're the ones who keep track of who has passed away and then provide the custom list to everybody. No doubt about that. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about trying to get people to come to this community and work for you guys, because I know you have some openings and I know uh, marketing's got some, you've got fundraising, you've got, you got it all over the place, a great community to come be a part of. Absolutely. I mean, my last two last two weeks I've been here talking about ring day and muster. Um, what greater job could an Aggie have than to be involved in helping keep those traditions strong? Um, and we do that year round. Right. right. It's not just those two things, but it's it's everything that is special about being an Aggie. Starting from the the experience people have in school, you know, providing scholarships, supporting traditions, um, providing emergency assistance to students, all of those things. It's a great place to work. It's very fulfilling, very rewarding. Um, We've got openings in the ring program. We've got openings in accounting. We've got openings for part-time students, and we've got opening for more openings for more seasons, prof seasoned professionals. Uh, tx.ag slash association jobs. Check them out. Yeah, to go check that out, great place to, be, to work. Uh, let's close up with you, Tracy. Talk, talk, kind of sum up for us again what you, you mentioned about the student side because there's a lot of activities going on and uh, you know from the embassy flag room through the barbecue and all that. Absolutely. If you're going to come to one thing, come to Aggie Muster and Reed Arena at 7 p.m. on April 21st. If you're going to come to multiple things, go see Class 74 in Aggie Park on Friday from 11 to 2 p.m. And of course, go check out the Reflections display. It's the way that we honor all of our families before Muster even happens. There's going to be a lot of cool displays made by the families, set up by them showcasing their Aggies life and really getting a personal connection with who we're honoring at muster ceremony. Awesome stuff. Thank you both for coming in. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. When we come back here on Tex Ags Radio, we'll go around Aggie land with Kay Nagley and try to get you caught up with some SEC stories. That and more is Tex Ags Radio.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Billy Lucci going to be joining us at the 10 o'clock hour. We will talk a lot of baseball. we got some football to get into. We'll go back to baseball. It'll be uh, it'll be a great hour. All right, uh, right now, though, it's time for Around the Association, presented by Norma G. State Bank. Norma G. State Bank, rock solid banking. The website is normagestatebank.com. And with that, we have Kate Negley. Around Aguilan, but you were close. What did I say? Around the association. Did I say that? You just talked to the Holy association smokes. guys, so it's, well, your brain's all, oh, man. I get it. Oh, God, what a fail. <laughs> it's okay. I caught it I, for you. I, caught, I did call it Aggie baseball, right? Yeah. Okay. Just making sure I didn't mess up that part of it. All right. No, you didn't call it a different sport. No, no. You're, you're good. Uh, Aggie well, Equestrian, which, by the way, we always in the news because they're so good. I know. They are great. Uh, let's start off with some softball because I don't believe we have talked softball. Uh, number 12, Texas A&M, even the series yesterday with number 13, Alabama. They are on the road this weekend as the Aggies exploded for 17 uh, runs on 13 hits and Mondays. So that's kind of an off series. Monday's rubber match is tonight slated for 6 p.m. on SEC networks. So that will be a national broadcast. It'll be great to see Trish Ford and the Ags hopefully claim a series on the road again, just like baseball. Yep. Those are always big to win on the road. Uh, speaking of baseball, Texas A&M outscored Vanderbilt 36 to six this weekend as they swept the doors in complete dominant fashion. Also being crowned atop the college baseball world at number one. Uh, that is a heck of an accomplishment. First time since 2016 that they have done so. Uh, and then the Aggies will conclude their five game homestand with a midweek contest against Air Force at 4 PM, a little earlier than normal, uh, on Tuesday at Blue Bell Park. So make sure to pack the park like they did all weekend. It was a heck of a crowd. Uh, women's golf earned the number three seed on Sunday at the 2024 SEC Championships. Uh, so great. And they, they will face off against number six seed Arkansas in the quarterfinals of match play on Monday. As he said earlier, they were already getting started this morning. Uh, some track and field news. And Liana Davidson claimed L- Liana, look at her. Liana Davidson, look who used to go. be a social center person I know, here. look at her go. She claimed her fourth javelin title this season. Go, Liana. And then Sam Whitmarsh climbed the Aggie all-time ranks in the 1,500 meter. Uh, and then Kimar, We say his name every week, don't we? Yeah, we literally. <laughs> there's a bunch of names. I'm just like, man, they just keep, here they go. keep getting repeated. But the Aggies will return home to close out their home slate this weekend or yeah, I believe that's what, yeah, this weekend's on Saturday as they host the alumni muster. So, man, track and field season really flew by. Uh, and then let's talk some football real fast. Sw- real game. fist. Real, real fast. Spring game is Around this week. Around the association. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I feel like we haven't even dived into spring game and all that talk because baseball's obviously just been the talk of the town. Um, but And then additionally this weekend, it was a great weekend for Aggie Sports, and I added a pair of 2025 prospects and didn't Ryan offensive lineman Marcus Garcia, and then QB Husan Longstreet. Great offensive weapons they got over the weekend. I'm sure Mike Elko and Colin Klein are thrilled about those. And last but not least, because we are not going to forget this, women's tennis secured its third straight SEC regular season title in a row, sweeping number 29 Alabama 4-0 at the Mitchell Tennis Center on Sunday. The Aggies became the first team to three-peat since joining the SEC in 2012. What a honor. Utter dominance by Mark Weaver and his squad out there. Super proud of them. The Aggies will begin preparing for the SEC tournament in Athens with their first match set for Friday, uh, April 19th. So postseason is um, upon them, and they've had a heck of a postseason run recently. Recently, so it's gonna be really interesting to see what they do. Great job, Kay. Of course. You think I should have called Steve Nagley this weekend? I do. If you were looking for something to be fixed, that man can fix it. Yeah. So, yeah. Steve, <laughs> I'm gonna holla. <laughs> we get Steve and Philip. I'm sure all there's house. a lot of different people in College Station that would willingly be like, David, I'll help you. Yeah. But I'm proud of you for. I'm trying. Reaching out to someone to admitting that you can't do it by yourself. The twins and I worked for three hours on yeah. Saturday, just us, and I realized. Were they a lot of help or? They were more helpful than I was. That's like they're, they're, they're smarter than I am. But I look at. They're like, Dad, no, you got to do it like No, this. they were like, Dad, I can't figure this out either. That's where they were at. <laughs> and then we went online and read the reviews of the shit that we bought. Uh-huh. And apparently even like, like civil engineers have struggled like with impossible it. It's like impossible. Yeah. Build. Like if you don't get the right plastic piece on this side, the whole thing doesn't work. Yeah. That's like me trying to build my college dresser a couple of years ago. And it's just, I'm like, Dad, come help. I don't know what I'm doing. Steve, I'm going to holler. It's coming. <laughs> All right, uh, Matthew, get a text or two in for us. Uh, <clears throat> sure uh, thing. 
uh, 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 voice crack. Uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't realize you were gonna come with me. A minute left. I know, I know. I was fixing my Excel sheets. Um, here we go. Um, Dave from '76. He said he drove by Olson Saturday at 4:10 p.m. and sections 202 and 203 were already packed for a 6 p.m. game. It's I'm nuts. telling you, we got football level excitement for this team. Yeah, it's it's real. Hey, and stay with it. Like if they do hit a bump in the road, stay with it. This team is made for the long haul, and uh, hopefully they don't send that too many bumps in the road. But just keep uh, packing up um, the ballpark, please. Okay, great job. Thank you. When we come back on Tex Ags Radio, Billy Lucci. We'll talk to Billy. We got baseball to talk about with Billy. We got some commitments to talk about with Billy. We've got some other football topics to get into with Billy. Might even talk about the UFC. There was an awesome couple of knockouts out there. I don't know if we'll get into it because there's too much Aggie stuff to get into, but it's on my mind. It's Tex Ags Radio. We'll be back.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. A lot of baseball to get into this hour. I got some football to get into with spring game coming up. Let's go to the hotline. Billy Lucci, executive editor and co owner of Tech Sags Radio or TechSags.com, I should say, here with us on the program. Billy, good morning. The game knows, and the game will reward you. Is that a Bronyism? Yeah, it was. He said that earlier. <laughs> I'm literally behind listening to y'all today, so. My segment is interrupting my my segment with you is interrupting me listening to you. Well, it was a great segment with Schloss, and and Bronny did provide some, yeah, some it was. really good analysis. Uh, just this weekend, man, how how fun was it? The blowout on Friday. I think I talked to you Saturday morning about it. Then I followed up with another one, and then following up with the uh, the sweep. Well, look, between what Schloss provides in, in those interviews hearing him talk about the double steal and and then Bronny's inside putting Dan in and I'm I was told Zane the other day, you know, we don't normally, you know, pump up Zane on air because we know what it does to him, but told him privately, now I'll go publicly. I was just really proud of him the other night interviewing Flash post game and, you know, this is a guy that came through the ranks from literally the intern level and now he's sitting there regularly doing one-on-one post games with the A&M head coach and I think doing a great job of it so it's fun to follow this baseball team it's even more fun to see the group we have covering it I think it's incredible but uh what a fun Sunday we got a lot to talk about don't we and spring game coming up but I think a lot of recruiting news I think you have football recruiting news from yesterday and plenty more to come. I think there's basketball portal stuff to talk about. The portal opens tomorrow around the country in college football. Uh, there's a ton going on, man. And uh, But it all starts with baseball. And oh, by the way, an SEC title this weekend as well. But uh, for, for uh, Mark Weaver and women's tennis, there's third in a row, right? So what a hell of a weekend in College Station. And uh, hopefully, the hopefully softball can cap it off uh, in Tuscaloosa when that series uh, tonight. What is that at six p.m. up out there in Panama? Yes, sir. When you're playing those perennial power teams like Bama softball is, and I know they're ranked right around where the Aggies are right now, Trish Ford's team. But when you're playing those perennial powers, it's just a little something different when you beat them and win a series, no matter where they're at. And that was particularly true this weekend because Vanderbilt's one of the best college baseball programs in America. They are year in and year out under Corbin. They've won national titles. And, oh, by the way, they're not down. That was number 16 that came in here and a team that had just won a series. I believe that series was in Baton Rouge. I'm pretty sure it was in Baton Rouge had just won two out of three and spanked LSU in game three and came in here looking to make a statement against A&M. And and the only statement that was made was that Bandy right now, at this point in the season at least, and certainly from what it looked like on that diamond, they weren't in the same league. They weren't in the same league. Talking to Billy Lucci here on Tech Radio. All right, so can we just kind of take this series – against Vanderbilt in parts, obviously the first game not only set a tone, it, 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 it was a knockout blow. It, fe- it felt like after that the, the Aggies were just going to run through the series. But then there's always that pause, right? You, you dominate one game, you get to the second game of the series, and who's the real team that shows up? And yet the Aggies had an encore for that. Well, that first game was as impressive as anything I've seen an A&M team do when you consider the opponent, right? Like, I heard y'all mention the A&M OU football game. I was thinking about, you know, A&M and what they did this year a few, you know, a couple months ago to Tennessee. One of the top five, number five or number six Tennessee team came in here, and A&M, Buzz Williams, Wade Taylor and company, Boots, just absolutely grilled them. Uh, wire to wire. That's what that Friday night game was like to me, except in baseball, you have to follow it up. Like you said, it's not the game is the three game series in, 
in you know the most simplistic of terms that the game is the three game series. So yeah, they had to come follow that up, and not only did they follow it up, they followed it up nine nothing. Or they were, or they were, you know, a, a bat away from run ruling them again against the guy that, after Friday night, everybody was telling me was their their best pitcher, the one that they faced Saturday. What they do to him, Nuno, to follow up fifteen nothing, they score five in the first inning. So, if Vandy thought it was going to be any easier or any more competitive, not easier, any more competitive, that was over in one inning against the guy that was their best pitcher. And then on Sunday to come back and you, and you knew you had a desperate Vandy team and, and your starter couldn't get out of the second inning and then Chris Cortez comes in, you chip away at that four-run lead, then you explode again. I think they fell behind 4 nothing, scored nine straight uh, and, and outscored them 12-2 to two the rest of the way. We're acting like that game was close because of what the other two looked like. A&M doubled them up. They scored 12 runs. That game was 12-6. to six. If you want to be really scared of this team, the 36 runs in three games is remarkable. And Vandy pitching. Again, I, Bama pitching this weekend, at least their starters. And then at the end of the year against Arkansas. Those are the only two that will compare to what the Aggies saw this week, and they scored 36 runs. Here's the crazy part. On Saturday, what's not talked of is they only, Aggies only had five hits in that game. Yeah. And I know it was documented that they won 9 nothing without Chase or Braden getting a hit. Well, the entire team only cobbled together five hits, and they won nine. They, they scored nine. Won nine zip. Like, just the fact that they, this offense can manufacture nine runs off of five hits because they, they draw walks. They get on base. They make you pay for mistakes. They'll mix in a home run in there. <clears throat> you know, so I just all around, I couldn't have been more impressed. Well, and offense is one thing, but the pitching you're getting from Ryan Prager that you get from Tanner Jones on the next day, I mean, if they don't beat you with offense, they'll beat you with pitching, and, and then the bullpen was solid this weekend. Yeah. But the bullpen was really good. You think about, I mean, Oshenbeck, <clears throat> two appearances. You didn't need, you said the bullpen, right? Yeah, uh, everything. All the pitching or was you great. Bottom, or you said, I didn't know if you said the bullpen or if you said the bottom of the order. But, yeah, I mean, Cortez was the story. You really didn't have to use much. How many pitches did they throw the whole weekend? Five? Yes, sir. Yeah, they used the three starters, Oshenbeck and Cortez. That's it. Five starters in an entire weekend against, or five pitchers in an entire weekend against Bandy. I mean, you think that's how Slosh drew it up? And even his most optimistic uh, of outlooks? No way. That they they exceeded, I think, any and all expectations. Well, and especially Ryan Prager setting the tone on Friday night, Billy. Oh man, he's been he has been uh, he's been pitching at all American level, at all SEC. I mean. I'm sure you go around the country and pick out guys that are doing as good, but his numbers are absolutely remarkable. I know, like, the strikeout numbers are high, but it's that strikeout to walk that, that, that you, that's rare that you see a strikeout to walk ratio like he's putting out there. But then also when you factor in, he missed all of last season. He kind of skipped a step. He went up from Sunday, then skipped, missed the season. And now, he, you know, this is his first year to be your Friday night SEC hammer. You know, and, and a lot of guys, they think they want that smoke until they get in there and they're on the, on the bump on a Friday night, even at home. But against those SEC lineups and in front of those crowds, sometimes that's too much for some, you know, at least early on. And when they take over on Friday nights, and he's been the exact opposite. I mean, I think he set a tone for this whole baseball team as much as any other individual player has with the way he's thrown on Friday nights, and especially these weekend series, uh, these weekend SEC series. He has really set a tone. And, and how many how many Friday night games have A&M lost in the SEC so far this season? 
I think it's just Florida. I think just they fell down oh one to Florida. I think that was it. You know, game one on Thursday, Friday, whatever. Um, Prager's been an absolute difference maker uh, for this team, and it just we can talk about Oshenbach. He's been incredible, and and Cortez and Rudis and their turnarounds, but but Prager doing what he does on Friday night sets the tone, in my opinion. Yeah, he sets the tone. Uh, obviously, the offense to follow that in the top of the uh, of these first innings. But Billy, you've watched Aggie baseball for thirty years, right? And we've had some number one teams come by. How does this one feel different than some of those other experiences you had? The twenty sixteen team. Uh, obviously, the the great teams in the late '90s. Just how, how does what what is the vibe compared? Well, I mean, I, I don't think I wouldn't say it's just so much better than the than the '16 team because they were coming off that '15 season, climbed up to number one, and that, that team could have done some real damage in the uh, in Omaha, I and mean, they ran into TCU, you know, and lost in three. To Slosh and, and the Horn Frog. I mean, had had they not drawn that team and gotten by them, they they could have made a real run there. And that's the beautiful and scary part of this uh, of this sport. You know that A and M went in there to Stanford last year with some real holes and beat them on Saturday and had Stanford and Braden Montgomery and, and a really good Stanford program on the ropes in their own regional. So it's always, I think though, with this team. You just check the boxes when I watch them of kind of all the great A and M baseball teams I've watched, you know. And, and I don't know that their pitching is—it's not what some of those teams had, but their hitting is as good or better than than any. Um, and I think they're the best coached A and M team I've seen. And it's not just Slosh; it's that whole staff, and it's what Early's done with the hitting, and what Wing's done with the pitching. Um, it's just, you know, it's as thorough, it's as complete a team as I've seen. Someone was trying to argue, you know, I forget who it was, somebody here local, well, they don't really have that Omaha pitching staff, and it's like, well, what does that look like? Because there's eight teams that go, there's eight different pitching staffs that go. Um, do they have a Paul scheme at the games at the top? No. Um, most teams don't. The rest of their pitching staff is much better than LSU's was last year on paper, just halfway through the conference season, what they're doing against in, in the same conference. And, oh, by the way, we just talked about Prager and what he's doing. So I, I don't know what that means, Omaha pitching staff. I guess that just means a top-five pick ace at the top, uh, first-round pitcher. No, they don't have that. I don't care if they do, if they do or not when Prager's pitching like a first round college pitcher, you know, like I don't care if he's a first rounder, he's an all American is how he's playing right now. So they do have a Friday night ace. They do have a guy that's shutting down SEC teams and they've got depth in that bullpen. I still think there's some keys that they can unlock even moving forward. This isn't a comparison, Billy. This is just an embarrassment of riches when I make this comment, but you look at the freshman season that Jace had last year. And never in my mind would I be envisioning Gavin Grohovac to be doing the same thing or more in his freshman year. Back to back years of these freshmen, like potentially being the top players on the team. I mean, you have Braden, you have Jace, you have Gavin, and two of those the last couple of years have been freshmen. Yeah, I mean, Jace was incredible last year, right? But. I think what Gavin Grahovic's doing is the best freshman season I've ever seen at a and True freshman. I mean, think of some of those bombs he's hitting and how he's playing third base, his batting average, what he's doing to SEC pitching. Oh, by the way, he's batting the leadoff. And y'all were talking about a hustle play last night and yesterday and him on the tail end of that double steal. How about later in the game when he goes and, and when a when has got a nice lead, and he goes and hustles out, legs out a double that should have never been a double. But it was pure hustle the minute he left the batter's box. And that set the tone for the rest of that inning. And I think that was when it was maybe 9-6. And, and, you know, then he was only going to have one more at bat. But there was 9-6. And then he hustled a second. And they ended up getting a three-run inning out of it. 
And there were a couple other hustle plays made by other guys then. And that was I'm telling you that had to do with Grahovic setting that tone as a true freshman. He does it so often. You go back to Saturday, you know, lead off home run. Okay, 15 nothing. we'll regroup, we'll go out there. Nope, lead off home run. This is how it's going to be today, too. So I think he's been incredible on so many levels. Um, I'd be interested to see, in terms of just right-handed hitters, how many better Slosh has had in his career. You know, I think of Luke and Baker at TCU, and I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, what Grahovic's doing is incredible. And there's so many incredible stories. That's the thing about this team. You know, you think about Jackson Appel and that storyline and Ali Camarillo and kind of an emerging story in Chestnut. You, know, you talk about Jason Brink. There's so many. But sometimes I do think we need to make sure we're talking about what Grohovic's doing uh, both in the field and at the plate. It's remarkable. I'm going through the uh, stats, Billy. Six guys batting 300 or better with the seventh right on the heels. Uh, Teddy Burton's at 295. One of those six guys I mentioned is Jace Lavalette, who, by the way, uh, not too long ago was batting 277, I think, over before the weekend started, and he saw his numbers raise up. Yeah, he had a good, I thought he had a good weekend. He's always going to draw walks and get on base, but, you know, just it seemed like he was seeing the ball. A lot better. I mean, obviously you had to be Friday night and the two home runs, but then, you know, yesterday with a couple big hits. So, well, I've never been worried about him. I think he's going to, you know, if he hovers around 300, he's going to hit home runs, he's going to get on base a ton, play good center field. But I think the wave is coming. And that's the thing, you know, you, you can look up and down this lineup and there's nine guys. So at any point in time, somebody's not going to be hitting as good as somebody else, but it just doesn't matter because it's like when one isn't, there's three or four that are is what it feels like. So, All right, Billy, we'll uh, get you here in studio here in a second. I know you made it to the building, so we'll talk to you here in a second. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, We're going to hit a break here. Uh, when we come back on Tech Sacks Radio, we'll continue with the baseball talk. we got to get into some uh, recruiting information as well as a couple commits over the weekend and then uh later on we'll just talk some other football things with spring football and whatnot but of course a heavy dose of baseball here on tex ags radio presented by david gardner's jewelers
We're back here on Tech Sacks Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Do want to make sure that everybody understands the uh, the Aggie muster that was said to be there at the uh, the Brazos County A and M Muster Club, I should say, is at the uh, Brazos County Expo at six o'clock. Not Legends. So Brazos County Expo six o'clock this Sunday. Uh, it was. I guess miss uh, told earlier. So make sure that you have the new information. We will update it on techsax.com as well. Expo center at six o'clock on Sunday. Our thanks to David Rhodes, who's the uh, chairman of muster who uh, gave us that information. So thank you very much to, to Mr. Rhodes. As we wait for Billy to get back into the studio, let's uh, go to the angry elephant news and social center. We've got some text messages about Aggie baseball. And we also got some storylines in the sec, Mr. Dawson, you'll have a time for one text. Cause I see Billy walking in. Ooh, one text. Uh, let me get to a texture from San Antonio comments. Uh, comments from about UT versus A&M game by Jackie Sherrill and Cole McCoy. Jackie Sherrill said this game is deserving of the state of Texas and also deserving of college football and deserving to be on a national television game. I'm excited about it, but I've always said I'd play Texas in a parking lot if I had to, to which Cole McCoy responded, I don't think you want to do that right now. <laughs> Ooh. Little, little words right there. Little words. Little words. I, uh... So we can take a few minutes here to reflect on Coach Cheryl, who I'm going to try to get on the show this week, Billy, and going into the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. And Coach Cheryl always saying, I'm ready to throw down with Texas anytime. Well, he kind of, I think he's the epitome of that when you think about Jackie Cheryl and you think about his football teams and just not backing down to anyone. And I always say this, at Texas A&M, we want a coach in any sport that the fans just watch our football, basketball, baseball team play and say, that's my coach, that that guy's with us. Kind of like Shoss. And, yeah, it just – I – that kind of coach at Texas A&M is what they – what we want. And Jackie's the epitome of that. He was forever when he was here. He still is. Um, but it was that mindset, and it was that – yeah, we'll play Texas where, just like you said the other night, we'll play him in a parking lot, we'll play him wherever. Because when he got here, it wasn't that way. You know, Texas had an upper hand. What it take, like, into year three, and they finally broke through, and then they just dominated Texas. And mo- that carried on through much of R.C. Slocum's tenure, too. Now, you know, you credit Mac Brown for coming in and turning that around. That was their era. Longhorn fans don't realize that was kind of their only true era post Daryl Royal. But... From once Jackie got that mindset instilled into his players, and they absolutely dominated Texas, and then it it lasted, you know. And and RC was part of that staff. So no surprise that RC had that exact same uh, mentality towards the Horns, and they did. But Jackie did that with everyone. That those were his. That was Texas A and M football during right. his time. And he's still that way. When you talk to him, you just feel like. He's one of those coaches that when you get to know him, and I've become really good friends with with Coach over the years and think the world of him, but when you really get to know him, there's just still, you can still say, yeah, I'd, I'd if I was a player, I'd run through a brick wall for that guy. Yeah. And all you have to do is see the number of players all these years later still. that still gravitate to him when he's around. It's cool. It's cool to see. Well, and... And he was followed up by RC, same vein, no same question. kind of, you know. <clears throat> no doubt about it. And it's hard. Literally just then, like, I'm sitting there and I told myself, well, we're talking about Jackie here. And it's like when you're talking about RC, we're talking about RC, not Jackie. But you have to separate them as back-to-back, you know, just incredible coaches here. And two that will never – that they'll just always hold a place in, in A and M lore. Well, I guess and then RC with just the fact. See, and, and this is why you just, it's just the good old days. Both of them. You talk about RC and how he's just he's never left here. He's still contributing to A and M in any way they ask. And again, but this weekend was about Jackie yep. and that group of players that went up there. I was, I was sitting there looking at all the pictures, trying to recognize everybody that was there. You know, that played for him. So. Special, special coach, special person, special honor for him. So that was cool. So great Aggie sports all weekend long. Mm-hmm. Women's tennis taking care of business. Aggie softball evening the series. You've got the, obviously the baseball success, the recruiting success over the weekend. We're a week, uh, a couple of days closer to the spring game. Did you have a chance to watch any UFC this weekend? I did. Yeah. I did. Well, I take that back. 
I didn't know that final fight. I would have come watched it with you. That final fight didn't start till like twelve forty. Yeah. I mean, it was basically the whole thing was over by like one a.m. Um, but I saw all the. I didn't get to watch because of all the, the because of Aggie baseball. I was there, um, but I saw all the how all the fights ended. Like I went and watched all the finishes and highlights and things like that. So I'm aware of what happened. That Holloway finish, um, that BMF fight, that was epic. That was. I mean, that was sports finishes. Yeah, that's about as good as it gets. You rarely see buzzer beaters in in fighting. What, what you rarely see buzzer beaters in in a in a UFC or boxing match. Well, I do want to touch on Masters here in a second, but the the thing, the cool thing about that was Holloway had won that fight free and clear. There was nothing he could do to lose that fight except yeah. what he did, which was last ten seconds of let's the fight. Go. Let's let's, and then he get, delivers the knockout blow. Usually, you're thinking this could be a, a disaster for him, yeah. and it went. Storybook for him. Well, that's I was joking about Bronny with the baseball gods. Pay attention, you know. That's like the fight gods weren't going to let him lose for yeah. being for being. You know, most people know what a BMF stands for, and if that's the belt you're fighting for, the bad mother, you you go embrace that as you're about to win it. So that's pretty cool. That was fun to watch. Did you keep up with the Masters? Yeah. yeah, I didn't watch a lot of it. I kept up with it. Again, like baseball had Baseball's me all top weekend. of mind, yeah. Um, but it's the Masters, so I watched as much as I could, and I followed. But wasn't a lot to follow. I mean, I thought Homa might have a chance. Mm-hmm. I, you know, that was about it. Um, Scheffler's badass. He is. He always has been. Aggies and his family. I think both sisters and uh, two sisters and his wife, all Aggies. So, great job, JT. <laughs> As we're about to go to lunch, I'll be hearing about that one. But, I, Scheffler, you mentioned Colt McCoy earlier, and he falls into this thing, too. Scheffler is a longhorn that uh, I have no problem rooting for. Yep. You know, just, A, you got to respect how well they are, at what they, how good they are at what they do. Guys like KD and... Colt McCoy, but but guys like Scheffler, Colt McCoy, like it's just I mentioned Colt just because you brought him up, but like Quan Cosby is a guy that I I've known for a long time. Just you, they're they're so good, and you just go, yeah, I respect the way that guy plays. And and in the case of Scheffler, it's you've just got to appreciate greatness. Yeah, like you mentioned the Warriors earlier, and KD being a Longhorn, you just you can't. You can't look at and those athletes and say, well, they're long. It's the same way, I think, last year at this time, even though it's a different scale with Scheffler and what he's done on the PGA Tour, but with Sammy Bennett, I had tons of Longhorns talking to me about him. I saw it on social media, and you know, everybody just, okay, I can get with this guy. Texas did it with Johnny while he was, you know, even, even while he was playing here. You know, all right, yeah, I wish we'd have him. Right, Scheffler's one of those long, you 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 don't even think about the fact that he's Longhorn or whatever. You just go, that guy's great in the way he carries himself, and he's a great winner of that tournament. It's like certain certain athletes I don't want to like, and then I'm like, you know what? I like him, Jaden Daniels. I like him. You know, I Scheffler's so easy to like. I never even crossed my mind not to like him. Right. You know, that was just like I'm like, well, whatever. Yeah. All right, we'll come back with some football here on Texas Radio. Right now, moment for Costa Vida Fresh Mexican Grill there at Olsen Field. And, of course, you know that you can find them in South College Station. When you go to the concession stand there at Olsen Field on the third baseline, you know you're going to get some great food, right? They, get, they got a lot of awesome items out there. The chili lime chicken, the sweet pork burritos. You've got the sweet pork Baja bowls, the chips, the queso, the key lime pie. And, of course, they've got Mexican hot chocolate. But it's about to get hot. So if you like hot weather or hot drinks in the hot weather, you can do that as well. In-store, they got the home run combo, a favorite option for Jace Lavalette and number 12, Ryan Targotch. That combo comes with an entree of sweet pork enchiladas smothered in house-made queso with rice and beans and a large drink. You can get that for eleven ninety nine. When you go to Costa Vida, you can go for breakfast, get your breakfast taco on, you can go for lunch, get your quesadillas on, get whatever you want there. Fresh Mex done the right way. Holly's there. She's a great Aggie. She uh, owns it, and she b- brought this vision to College Station because she loved the fresh food that was there at Costa Vida. 4501 Mills Park Circle in South College Station. Again, that is 4501 Mills Park Circle in South College Station. It's Costa Vida.
Tech Sags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Billy's still with us here for the last half hour of the program. Can we get into a little football this segment, Billy? Is that all sure. right with you? Um, let's go with uh, Denton offensive lineman Marcus Garcia and, of course, Hussan Longstreet, both committing uh, this weekend. Uh, your, your thoughts, I guess, first on the, uh, the big lineman there from, uh, De- uh, from Denton, excuse me. The lineman there from there. Do I say there that much? <laughs> you know, you well, had- you, let's go like this. You just said, let's think about it like this. Okay. Just, you just said the lineman there from Denton. The lineman there from Denton. Think about how just awkwardly placed that there sure. is. I, while I 100% agree with you, uh-huh. in retrospect, I shouldn't have spoken that way. You have the amazing <laughs> ability to find anything you can. <laughs> and all of us. It's not just Billy. It's not just David Nuno. It's all, you have this. And like, the bad thing is, radar. everybody does it now. Well, I don't. You don't. You're right. Everybody else does, but you. Like, let me explain to you guys what happened a moment <laughs> you ago. Are, right. I have my headphones in my hand right here, and Billy sees it from far away. He's like, "What is that in your hand? You thought it was a wart or something? A boil?" Is that? Well, you, you were going it. like this with it, and I was like, "Oh, get that thing away from your face. What is that?" I was concerned for you, Thank and you. I was like, "Why have you not treated that thing?" But it was just, it was just a. <laughs> earpiece see now you're making fun of my eyesight there and everywhere (laughs) making fun of my vision all right uh let's talk about marcus garcia there at denton ryan um look here's what what i like about what a&m's doing i I hope people are kind of following along enough to understand you're following enough you know how long a&m wanted garcia and how long he's been a priority for the staff Mm -hmm. and to close this guy out i mean look you you're watching him play he's a 6'5 275 pounds so i i still love a lineman that physically is going to fill out between the time they commit and finish high school and get here and through their first year and let tommy moffitt get his hands on him so you look at you you see him in person and you see what he looks like, and, and look at him just he's all the way to the end zone with that one. Right. Um, for a guy that height, he plays with, I think, really good leverage. He's physical. He's a finisher. Um, and pretty damn athletic, too, if you watch his feet. I and mean, great footwork and agility. So he's a total package. And, at that again, at that size, at tackle, he's going to be a guy that, to me, you could be talking about a six six, you know, six let's say six five if if that's a if that's a six four plus high school measurement or recruiting service measurement. He's right around six over six four, almost six five, two seventy plus. This they say two fifty five here. I think he's bigger than that. Uh, maybe two seventy. I think he's a guy that'll be in that three ten range when it's all said and done. At tackle, perfect size, long arms, like we talked about his athleticism. I'm a fan. And look, we list him at 255. I'd like to get Howell to get a fact check on that on that size because if he uh, if he's that, then you're looking more like a. I think he's bigger just from seeing him. Yeah. But if he's that, he's you're talking about like a Cedric Obwehi type build. But I think he's filling out to well north of 300 pounds pretty quickly. Between another year, essentially, till he's here, and then a year in Tommy Moffitt's weight room, I think this dude is, is, has a chance to be special. And then Hassan Longstreet, the quarterback. Speaking uh, of special. Super special. Well, and speaking of priority targets, this was a player that Colin Klein singled out Virtually from day one, and, and to the point that like it didn't ever feel like David that they were. It never felt like they were really hot and heavy after any other quarterback in this class. Right. It felt like Colin Klein handpicked him. He's probably well aware of him when he was at Kansas State, and they went all in to the point where you know there had to be the conversation for them to not be really in deep with any other QBs, you know there had to be the conversation between Elko and Klein of like, hey, okay, that's fine. If we do this, we've got to get him. And there had to be a lot of confidence on on Coach Klein's part that he could make it happen. And for them to close on 
Longstreet this early, I think it's a big, big deal. Number one, you get your guy and you look at him taking deep shots. You can see him as a runner. He's a, he's a leader and a winner. You talk to people um, that know him or are familiar with him down there in California that say he is a just a fun player to watch, a fun kid to be around, a really smart young football player. So, you know, ticking off all the boxes sure. there. Um, and then you just watch him on the field. He's electric. Look at the, some of the throws he makes, the accuracy, arm strength, the release. Um, yeah, he's I, – I just don't – I don't see anything he can't do on a football field. And I think right now he's borderline five-star. I think as this, as this season plays out, as this offseason plays out, these elite 11s and these things, I think you're going to see him end up being a five-star. QB for the Aggies in this class. And regardless of whether he's very high four or five, it doesn't, it, it matters for uh, perception's sake. And you always want the class to be ranked high. And, and the more of those fives you can get, the better. But it's really about getting a big name, well known, high performing quarterback that not just you and I or any of the fans on Tex Ags or, you know, our recruiting team, anybody, not just that we can look at and go, oh, wow, he's really good, yep. or the A&M coaches, but that every recruit in the country and every receiver you try to recruit now, they can watch this tape. They know of him. They know who he is. He's a big name. He's got that personality. So you kind of can have your centerpiece of this recruiting class now, and yeah. you're doing it very early. You're doing it you know, by mid-April. A lot of times you're not seeing A&M and other schools even – get these court for the Aggies anyway I guess it was uh you know the last time they got like a big big quarterback commit this early like a big name they had Eli Holstein for a minute but that was around camp time if I'm not mistaken but it was it was uh it was Connor Wigman right as far as a big name that like the whole country knew and that's exactly what Longstreet is so that and look, I'm, I'm looking at the class right now, and so many of these guys, you go down that list, and Hal and Bronny know this, and I know this, and we've talked about this. So many of those guys on that list, virtually every one of them, was a long the, – the, they inherited Josh Moses on the O-line. So it, there's, there's what? There's six others. All six of them are guys that this staff prioritized – and said, okay, we need to go out and get them. So they're doing great in that regard. Now adding somebody like Longstreet, and, and you're going to start seeing, I think, you know, Rink and Longstreet here recently are a little bit more high, even though Rink's ranking isn't what I think it should be. They're more high-profile names on the recruiting scene, and I think you're going to start to see a little bit more of that too. I think O-line is a position to really watch here in the next – I don't know, week or so, right. two weeks. You know, up, upcoming here, keep an eye on O line. They've got a couple guys that they they really not they really more than a couple, but several that they knocked it out of the park with this weekend. They had a tremendous group of linemen in, and I think there'll be some immediate impact coming out of that, and then there'll be some. You know, they they've made headway with a couple of you know those five star blockers that we're talking about. So I'd keep an eye on that, and then. I know the recruiting team and I still feel really good about where they're at with some of these D linemen as well, particularly uh, DJ Sanders over there in Belleville. So on Wednesday when I went to spring ball practice, I was looking for a couple of players that I didn't know, just wanted to see the new guys, and I was looking for Jabri Barber. Didn't see him mm -hmm. this weekend. It comes out, uh, the foot injury. I know you yeah. commented on it. Just uh, doesn't change what they're trying to do, but it is obviously a blow. Well, here's – I, I've said before, I said it the other day, I'm really impressed with, I was really impressed with Cyrus Allen mm -hmm. and, and Barber, both of them. I thought they did good work in the portal. And Isaiah Williams, I think, is going to be really good, the true freshman uh, out of Florida. But losing Barber, it, it hurts at least a little, maybe a lot. You know, it just depends on where he was going to be able to work his way into the rotation. But he was really quick really fast, could catch the ball. Like, I liked him. Um, but 
with that said, I think Texas A&M, A, you're going to get him back. He'll be out for an extended period of time with a foot surgery. I mean, he's going to be out, we're talking months. And I don't know if that means three months or five months, but if it's three months, three, four months, you're pushing Start right season. up against yeah. it, right? And then you, we know it's a foot, so those tend to be a longer thing than, you, than you'd expect. But he might be back. With that said, I think they were going to go hunting in the portal anyway, beginning tomorrow at that position. Because I've said it a million times, you got three good ones at the top. But if there's a, a all conference candidate out there or somebody that you think, you know, can make an, a big difference, you're there's still I think there's still reason to go get them. There's still reason to go get them because you you're not gonna make it through a season with the numbers they have. And yep. and you've got guys in there that have that have been hurt before and have missed games. So I, I would absolutely go out and try to get one more in the portal. I don't know if Barber's injury makes that too. Um, but I just think I, I don't know that it necessarily does. I think it's still probably if you go find a guy that's elite to go with Noah, Moose, Jade, I think that's what they need. Cyrus. I mean, you need like five Real guy, and then you've got the freshmen, and you've got, you know, they actually got some nice walk-ons that I think are doing nice things this spring. But I still think you need to go portal and go get an impact receiver if you can get him. I don't think Barber's injury necessarily bumped that to two. Okay, I think it's still go get one. Okay, let's hit a break here. We'll come back with one final segment. It's Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio. As a reminder um, that the uh, muster, obviously, is going to be at the Brazos County one. It's going to be at the Expo Center, 6 o'clock on Sunday. Just fixing an earlier mistake. We got it fixed here on Tech Sags Radio. Let's do this. Let's uh, open up the phone lines for Double Days. Can we do that? Let's, uh, it's time to end the day with Double Days. Caller number 12, 979-693-1150. We'll hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Days. They've been serving Aggieland since 1984 with your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls. Reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDays.com and your favorites are on their way. And as a reminder, they are not open on Mondays. Billy, I understand you got an interesting tweet your way. Interesting tweet over there by John Rothstein oh. and uh, Purdue A&M Saturday, December 14th at, at uh, Gainbridge Fieldhouse in Indy. Aggies and Boilermakers. All right. A non-conference action. A&M continuing that uh, Big Ten stretch of games. So it was Ohio State, Penn State last year, Penn State in the tournament the year before. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like you're in the SEC. Get out there and, and play, I think, the Big 12 still and the Big 10. Go play mm-hmm. teams out of those, you know, the ACC, these non-conference games. Uh, always help. But guess what? You're playing a Purdue team that played for the national title this year, national runner-up, very high profile early in the season, minus – Zach Ed, so that helps. That, well, minus that boots. does help. Minus yeah. boots, but my, hey, I love boots, and I, <laughs> Zach Eady. and Aggies are really gonna miss him. But Zach Ed is the guy you don't want running around in the paint over there. Well, maybe they uh, replace him with this tweet I saw from uh, the Athletic. Jordan Pope plans to visit Texas A and M uh, on the 18th. Pope averaged 17.6 points, two and a half rebounds, and three to assist this season for Oregon State. So. Apparently, some Buzz uh, and company are pretty active in the portal right now, so yeah. get ready. I mean, I'd say, and then and, you know, I, real soon you'll you'll see some activity. And the the primary goal here is keeping that core nucleus intact. And then if you could supplement, I wouldn't even say supplement because you still want to get game changers, right? And look, we've talked about it. They didn't have as much impact in the portal last year, although you know who knows what Jace Carter could do this coming season. But they didn't have as much pop in the portal. At, but it, Andy Garcia, mm-hmm. uh, we mentioned Boots. As, I don't think there was a portal back then. He's so old, but a transfer. Henry. Uh, Henry Coleman. You had um, Dexter Dennis. Dexter Dennis was elite. Julius Marble, who had a, a really strong year last year before you know that he was unavailable this season. So they've done a... Buzz has done a really nice job in the portal. If they could do it this year, you could have a special basketball team next season because it's almost like you're just – they're close, and if they can bring back – and by the way, everyone's coming after these guys. But you bring back Wade and Andy and Solo and Manny and Jace, and then you got Henry. Like, if you can bring back that core nucleus and then just add – Three legit transfers, maybe even four. I mean, there's there's the numbers to do it. How about this? Follow the uh, baseball approach, which you have a really great team already. Let's bring in the top recruit or the tr- top transfer in the country. That'd you know nice. what? You know why I don't think a and basketball can do that? Why is that? I don't think there's enough nil money for them to do that. Again, that, I just named a lot of guys that you really want to and mm-hmm. need to keep. A um, couple of them, you know. Are, probably commanding a ton of money on the open market if, if just people trying to poach. Um, I don't think A&M can go out and, and do what some other basketball pro- – I know they can't do what some other basketball programs can do. Yeah. What baseball was able to do. Um, baseball was able to do that also because – I think that Braden was looking to come you know, to this part of the country, yep. play in the SEC – uh, there were some ties to the Houston area with his hitting coach. So there were some, I wouldn't say, it certainly wasn't teed up. And I think you'd be naive to think that um, that guy's out there playing without NIL. But, but, I don't think basketball can go out and get, if you told me here's the number one top five players in the portal right now, I think it would be, you'd almost have to use all your allotment and get one player when you really probably need 
at least three, if yeah. not a fourth. Billy, thank you very much, buddy. I did. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right, uh, that's going to do it for Tech Stacks Radio. Yeah, I thought you had some call coming in. No, we, we got it taken care of. Okay. Our thanks to the Association of Former Students stopping by. Uh, Jim Schlossnagel calling in earlier in the program. Of course, Brian Broninger, Olin Buchanan, and this guy, uh, Billy Lucci. Thanks so much. We'll catch up with you mañana.